Hey, everybody. We have an exciting guest on Limitless today. That is George Howard. George is a former CEO, a member of the Comet Research Group, and the founder and organizer of the Cosmic Summit. The Comet Research Group has found undeniable evidence of comet impacts. These impacts have been completely missed in the mainstream narrative of our history. The Cosmic Summit is having its second annual conference in Greensboro, North Carolina, June 15th and 16th. This is a collection of some of the brightest and most open-minded people in the world. If you haven't purchased your tickets yet, head over to CosmicSummit.com. In this episode of Limitless, we dive into cataclysms, vases, ball lightning, the controversial thunderstorm generator, and much more. Make sure you subscribe to Matt Bell Limitless and let us know what you think of the episode in the comments. Hope you guys enjoy this conversation with George Howard. But a big section of it was on Carolina Bays, and that's how I came okay. across that. Okay. And so, uh, what was the prevailing theory back then about the Carolina Bays? Yeah, the the what still is maintained by the scientific community is that uh, it was the uh, solution lacustrine aeolian okay. hypothesis. Okay, same thing as today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, that's right. It. Right. Yeah, it Got hadn't it. moved far. Yeah, and. Um, I love that Rube Goldberg name. You know you got a problem with right. a hypothesis when you've got to take three different yeah, 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 things yeah, and yeah. mix them together. Right. You know? yeah. And <laughs> use words like whatever, lacustre. Yeah, solution, lacustre, yeah, nail, yeah, 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 <laughs> which yeah. is and basically so, wind and water right. yeah, blowing. You, yeah, you can't just say wind and water. Otherwise, you know, people will uh, probably start to understand and ask questions about you know, what, <laughs> what, right. what's you, really going on here. Yeah. you got to obscure it a right. little bit yeah, with yeah, some yeah, jargon, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like UAP. You know, you can't yeah, just Yeah, 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 you got to switch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People wonder. So, uh, because um, Carolina Bays are generally wetlands mm -hmm. or lakes. In mm -hmm. fact, they're always wetlands in their natural state mm -hmm. or lakes. Mm -hmm. And people can become familiar with the lakes. People know where they are in North Carolina, mm -hmm. right? And they know they're these weird oval lakes. Yeah. Um, but what they don't know, and Chris Cottrell did such a good, I don't need to plow all that again for folks. He did such a wonderful job. Yeah. But people don't even know they're around them, mm -hmm. that there's such a subtle elevation feature. Yeah. He said his sister, I think it was yeah. his sister, had one in her backyard and didn't even didn't yeah. even realize that it was there. You know, Isn't I mean, that wild? Unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. The, yeah. I, I think 120 million people or so live within a three-hour drive of yeah. Carolina Bay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they're spread from New Jersey to Georgia. Yeah. And then they pick yeah. back up in Nebraska and Kansas. Yeah, yeah. For, for people that have no idea what we're talking about, they have to watch the episode with Chris Cottrell because he did an incredible job of explaining it. But And he continues to do a great job of yeah. explaining it to people. Yeah. And, and yeah. as we discussed before the show, um, I wrote an a essay on it and put it on the web in 1997 on Carolina Bays. And that became like the number one Google hit for the term. Uh-huh. And then I was like the go-to guy and people would email me. And if we'd had podcasts, I guess I'd go on podcasts mm -hmm. talk about it. But I was Carolina Bays all the time. But I also, in that paper, said it appears that something could have happened 13,000 years ago that caused this because okay. there's a lot of evidence that there was a dramatic climate crash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this actually segues into how I got into the Younger Dryas Impact. Okay. And subsequently, the Comet Research Group. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So you're in. Uh, okay. Got it. Yeah. So yeah. so you are you were one of the very early people to know about the Carolina Bays and to recognize that there's something else going on here in the 1990s. Is that correct? In the modern vein, yeah. it had died out as a subject, but it was tremendously controversial. That's why the senator knew of it. When mm -hmm. he said it was a big thing when I was a boy, mm -hmm. what he was referencing when it was on the cover of Harper's Magazine, the comet that hit the Carolinas. Mm. And it became a little sensation. And the assumption was, as anyone would make that looks at them, there is no one that looks at bays from an aerial photograph and says anything, well, wow, something slapped into the earth. Right, right. And then right. science had to talk us out of that. Mm -hmm. But in the 20s and 30s, there was a fevered rush to the Carolinas mm -hmm. to go and dig them up to see where they could find the meteorite. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, the same thing was happened a few years earlier in Russia where they went out to Tunguska uh -huh. and dug around in uh -huh. neat oval bogs, mind you, uh -huh. trying to find the rock. You don't yeah. find the rock. And the early people that said it was what we call primary impacts – Mm -hmm. um, those early researchers, and these were PhDs and geologists. And mm -hmm. in fact, the chair of the geology department at the University of North Carolina mm -hmm. damn near died with a pen in his hand, arguing that they were mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. caused at once mm-hmm. but from he, above. They, but they didn't realize that it was 70,000, oh, over 70,000. Oh, they had no them. idea. Right, right. Until the LIDAR, when LIDAR revealed how many there were, that yeah. totally changed the, the, the game in terms of like direct impact. I mean, the splash hypothesis just makes so much more sense given not only the yeah. angle that they all face all over yeah. across the country, but but also, in, you know, how, how many there are. It's yeah. just, yeah, direct impact is... Uh, I mean, unless somebody's like, you know, shoot, yeah, yeah, shooting yeah. a gun It's a out blood of spatter pattern. It's yeah, blood yeah. spatter. It's yeah. not the bullet. Right, right. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it throws it out. Yeah. So I had that paper up on the web and I got a um, got an email from an archaeologist one day. Mm-hmm. And this was before I was in regular touch with scientists like these days. And I said, like, wow, archaeologist can tell me. But I was like, whoa, this guy's a nut. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I've... I have a site in Ganey, Michigan, which is actually a significant Clovis site, and I'm finding <clears throat> spherules and marks in the chert and tracks and whatnot. I forget what line of evidence he had, but he had the early whiff of what we later well characterized. And his name was William Topping, and he was he was a strange bird yeah. and well-renowned, but he was a credentialed archaeologist. So I kind of, you know, hey, thanks, you know, that's very interesting, blah, blah, blah. And bombarded me with emails. And then I got one, another one. It said, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Howard. Um, I'm Dr. Richard Firestone, and I'm in touch with William Topping. And um, I'd, we'd like to talk to you about the Carolina Bays. What, what had happened was they had found evidence at this site and elsewhere, and we can go into that, that there might have been a tremendous cataclysm above North America, Roughly the Midwest, Michigan, thirteen thousand years ago was their hypothesis. Mm-hmm. To topping and, and Firestone, mm-hmm. and then they had Googled or out of this stood or whatever in the world we were doing in the late nineties. Yeah. And my paper popped up, and they had no, they didn't know of Carolina Bays, okay. so they were like, "Holy cow!" You know, it's kind of independent confirmation. Somebody else said that thirteen thousand years ago there was a climate crash. Mm-hmm. Or and maybe it's related, mm-hmm. and here we are finding us, you know, archaeological and sedimentological evidence for mm-hmm. this. So um, I said, looked at Firestone's email, and then I see at the bottom of it, you know, that it was, his address was One Cyclotron Drive, Berkeley, California. I said, well, that's a pretty fancy address. Mm-hmm. This guy's for real. <laughs> And Richard conv- uh, continues to be a friend, okay. and he's one of the uh, top, if not the top, isotomic scientists. He wrote the Book of Isotopes, which is like one of these seven hundred dollar multi volume things that sits in physics libraries, I suppose. But they wrote a paper in two thousand and one, uh, published in a thing called the Mammoth Trumpet, and they revealed the evidence that they had, such that it was, and they made what I would think in retrospect or some mistakes, justifiable mistakes, because mm-hmm. it was just the first iteration of the yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. And they took a lot of grief immediately, and it kind of disappeared. Mm-hmm. And then around t- in 2005, I got in, uh, another group reached out, or another fellow, Dr. Alan West, who continues to be a dear friend. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, I know you've been in touch with uh, Topping and Firestone. I am going to try to publish... Uh, the next iteration okay. of this hypothesis that there was an uh, an ice age comet mm-hmm. encounter mm-hmm. with North America, I said, "Good man, I was wondering where this was going. It kind of died. They did one paper that was so exciting, then nothing." And he said, um, "I'd like you to help out if you're interested." And so I actually did a lot of field work for him for two or three years, and we cored bays in North Carolina. Okay. And also, he had a good hack where you would go to roadside cuts where the Department of Transportation had already cut through one. Mm-hmm. And then you'd clean off the face. And okay. You don't have to do the coring. Gotcha. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And I would go out there and actually brought soil scientists because I had some that worked with me and stuff. And we did proper protocols. And I probably mailed, I don't know, 200 pounds of stuff mm-hmm. back to him and the fellow that was working with him, um, uh, Dr. James Kennett who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the founder of the discipline of paleo-oceanography. Very, very respected, um, well-published scientist. And Mm -hmm. here he had this, you know, wild paper that they're developing with, with, um, with West because he found the evidence so compelling. So maybe we can talk about what that evidence is. But I went out, did kind of the Bay work, 
And we published a paper in 2007. And I think that's kind of an important part of my story because I know there are a lot of people like I am and like you are out there that are kind of pajama scientists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that are sitting yeah. around on the internet at night and yeah. digging in and probably reading more papers than your average scientist does, yep. you know? Yep. And I was wonderfully blessed to be that kind of guy and then actually get to publish with them and get, you know, as a co-author, get all the revised drafts, watch the submission process, sit on the edge of your chair, you know, mm -hmm. uh, battle with the reviewers and all that kind of stuff. And, and we, um, the paper was published in 2007 and we had 23 co-authors and I say it's 22 PhDs and me. Mm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And I got to be kind of the citizen scientist okay. and I continue to play that role with what we now call the comic research group. Mm -hmm. And you can find them at comicresearchgroup.org. Mm -hmm. And, um, that first paper, again, it had 23 people on it. And then we continued to add disciplines and other special people and to dig in harder and harder on the evidences that, that, that we were finding. And the first hack, if you will, because the, the, the Comet Research Group until recently was very poorly funded, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's mostly a volunteer effort, and we would toss in cash for the sample testing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the evidence, the first thing that they did that was very, very smart was we don't have the money to go pay for uh, – to go find new sites where we can find evidence for this destruction. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. We don't have the money to do that and do our geochemistry and our electron microscope work because a lot of this stuff is nanomaterials and date it. <laughs> okay. So what you do is go to well-dated archaeological sites, the iconic ones, uh, Murray Springs in Arizona, you know, Blackwater Draw in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And if you go and work those sites and you get access from the proper, you know, uh, site managers and mm -hmm. say, I'm going to take some sediment samples up and down this profile mm -hmm. um, at your site, you already know what the age is. Right. You don't have to argue that out. Right. It's well established right. that a particular point at both of those sites I mentioned, and there are dozens and dozens of others now, um, that we know that that's 13,000 years ago. Yeah. So what do you see on that face of sediment? You see a black mountain layer 13,000 years ago. Layer. Yeah, it's clear as day at Murray Springs. I mean, just to, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's the most obvious thing in the world that something cataclysmic happened at that point in time. And even the soil below the mat for thousands of years is one shade. Yeah. And then above the mat, it changes. Right. So you're like, the right. whole world changed yeah. after yeah. that moment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they would do the sediment testing down that profile. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the black matte layer, just below it, and a lot of people justifiably confuse that. They think the black matte is the material we're seeking, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's just below uh, it. Immediately below it uh -huh. is where you find the breath of hell. Okay. Okay. And what are you finding? You're finding uh, yeah. You're finding um, platinum, iridium. Well, what you... first thing is you're finding these spherules. Okay. Which are basically frozen droplets of cosmic and terrestrial material from air bursts. Okay. Where there is a class of impacts, and this is an important part of this stuff. Now there were probably uh, uh, ground impacts, and we think that it destabilized the ice sheet, and there might have been a significant one or a handful of them um, on the. Uh, Canadian ice cap at the time, mm -hmm. which was two miles thick, mind you. Mm -hmm. But they were probably in the Michigan uh, Michigan area. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But there were probably thousands of air bursts uh -huh. all around the world. And uh -huh. an air burst is when you get something um, under two hundred meters, it doesn't make it to the ground. Uh huh. In depending on how it comes in. Right. Okay. Um, that things up to 200 meters, I guess that's the way you'd look at it, cannot make it to the ground, some of them. Mm -hmm. Although that sounds bright big. Well, maybe I'm 200 feet in meters. Mm -hmm. But let's say something's the size of a car and it comes in. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like when you – <laughs> some people told me this is a bad analogy. I still like it. When you're committing suicide yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you jump off a bridge, yeah. you don't leave a crater on the bottom of the river. Right. Right? Right. You – hit the change in density mm -hmm. of the water and you explode, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing happens when you're coming in from space. You're going from a relative vacuum 
to a much, much denser atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it splashes into that, mm -hmm. and that splash is a hot explosion of hell yeah. that can even reach the ground with no solid material. Right. And that's what happened in Russia in 1908. We think. We think. Most likely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good. And, uh, yeah, there's this there's crazy theory yeah. about it being Nikolai Tesla um, experimenting, which, uh, you know. See, this is where I play mainstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything has a percent chance of being uh, the truth, and that one's probably low. But uh, We but, think a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what were they finding? So what yeah, were you guys finding the, down these there? These spherules are basically the frozen rain of the molten material that's from those plasma jets that are. And that's found all over the world. Yeah. Right. We so, haven't not found it. Yeah. Right. We found it on five continents. Right. Right. And I think it's 90 locations or so. So, so, so you've got a handful of meteors yeah. coming in and, and, and they're exploding a couple of hundred feet above the ground mm -hmm. and you're finding the material from that explosion. I mean, what, what, would they have been coming in from all over the world to be able to be finding the, 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 the spherical? Spherical? Spherules. It's hard to spherules. pronounce. Spherules. Yeah. Spher okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how is it that we find that all over the world? I mean, what did it did it go somehow up into the atmosphere and then and then sort of you know start to come down and land all over the world? Yeah. Or? It yeah. created a nuclear winter. Got it. Got okay. It. And that was mostly an effect of the burning. Okay. But the uh, and there's a plenty of soot out there. In right. fact, it appears that ten percent of the world's biomass was on fire. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. right. So you find that Which evidence is insane of course. to think about. It and, is. It, and it makes you think yeah. about okay, the underground structures in Turkey, yeah. you know, and like the underground cities that they built and they dug all the way down to. I mean, if ten percent of the world's biomass is on fire and the the, the atmosphere is just you, you want to be underground. You want to be underground. 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. you you look at those and say, what was the motive? for this. Right, but right, right. Particularly if you had repeated episodes, that was definitely the biggest, and we can get into that. Yeah, it, yeah. We think there's been other things that have happened that was particularly active uh, in the more distant past. Yeah. But what happens is it kicks that stuff up and molten mm -hmm. material, mm -hmm. and then that vapor, it's a vapor, mm -hmm. and that vapor freezes, mm -hmm. and then you find these tiny, tiny, tiny little... Uh, uh, spherules. Mm -hmm. And when you test their uh, geochemistry, mm -hmm. they in um, they have chemistry, which is uh, cosmic. And at first we were looking for iridium, which is what they proved the KT boundary, the dinosaur killer. Mm -hmm. All of the science that we use, if you can put it that way, all the techniques and the forensic approach that we have used in the Comet Research Group to show that there was a cataclysm 13,000 years ago was previously used in the 1980s to demonstrate the dinosaur killer. Okay, got it. But, but no iridium found from 13,000 years ago? We had hints of iridium, okay. but one, it's expensive as hell to test for. Okay. It's subject to this thing called the nugget effect, where you might have it at some locations of the sample and not others. Mm -hmm. So it's squirrely. Okay. Okay, so we include that in the first paper. The good news is we ended up coming up across an excellent marker, which is very inexpensive to test. And again, when you have iridium, just so folks know, you, there's a, something called uh, average crustal abundance, mm -hmm. where you can expect in the earth for any given soil to have this much iridium, which was basically less than nothing parts per billions, mm -hmm. right? But at the KT boundary, it's elevated. And it might just be a couple of hundred parts per billion, mm -hmm. but it's a hundred times more than you would expect. Gotcha. And you know that the only place that's coming from, it's not coming from volcanoes, for instance, right? Right. Has to be from above. Right. So what we found was that platinum was mm -hmm. the signature element of this event. Okay. And fortunately, can test for platinum um, for 40 bucks a test. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So it's funny, you zoom way up to current times, uh, the most recent paper from the Comet Research Group was a Florida site called Wakulla Springs. Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. yeah Maybe I'm Ryan familiar. could bring that up or yep. show it in the background because yep. beautiful, beautiful um, images in that paper, LIDAR images. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, but Wakulla Springs, I think it's up in the panhandle. Yeah. Yeah. And at that site, he poses in the paper, which I think is very smart because it's helpful to the discipline that we should be using this platinum um, peak, mm -hmm. distinct platinum peak that we're finding at 13,000 years ago, where just put aside whether it was catastrophic or not. Mm -hmm. It is useful to archaeologists 
because they'll know something's 13,000 years old. Mm -hmm. It's another way to know you've reached that special period right. in Earth history. And it's a very special period. And just so people may know, that's the um, the break point between the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Right. The two, our current geological age and the previous geological age falls at this point. Moment. You say, well, well the why, why'd they the, do the split there? The end of the Ice Age. Yeah, it's the end of yeah, the Ice Age. Yeah. You think we're still in an Ice Age? Um, I think relatively, they say, yeah. in a sense that yeah. we are. We've still got a, you know, some uh, pretty think, significant, we got a big ice cap on the bottom. Yeah, no doubt. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> things definitely warmed up. Like, at, yeah. at the, so 13,000 years ago, whenever this event happened, things, you know, things got warmer. There's there's less ice, you know, there's not ice yeah. in Michigan anymore. You know, the, the northern hemisphere, the ice cap is obviously receded. Um, but, but the question is, I mean, we've been in an ice age for 2.5 million years, something okay. like that. And uh, to have it just end because of a cataclysm like this kind of begs the question, did it, did it really end? And is it yeah. going to get cold again before, you know, at, at some point in time, once, you know, we, yeah. we, we move through this time period. So that's always been a question in my mind, you know, are we really out of the ice age or are we not? I know we've separated them in our minds, you know, from, uh, from the from Pleistocene to the Holocene, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, but the question is kind of, is that a, is that a legitimate separation or was it just caused by this event? And this event, if you, go down to the actual time period of Younger Dryas, recall that when the uh, bad day happened, mm -hmm. it plunged the world into a colder period. Right. 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 So right. you went through 1,200 yeah. years of just nightmarish, hellacious cold, cold. Right. and yeah. vicious winds, their dust, you know, the, the lurs or los, whatever you want to call it, that's found all over the world, the right. windblown dust. Yeah. A lot of that dates back yeah. to this time period. You don't want to have been near the equator at that point in time. No, for, it, for it, was, sure. it was a bad day, man. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, It and got back as cold as it was during the peak of the Ice Age, like 25,000 years ago. That's right. And ago. right before the impact, even though there was two miles of ice above Michigan and parts of Pennsylvania and stuff, yeah. um, it was actually, they say, a little bit warmer than it is today. We had already, it hadn't melted yet, uh -huh. but we had gotten to... At that point, it was dramatic and moving up and down, but it was actually a little bit warmer. Just call it basically like it is today, but you still had the ice there from the last uh, ice, you know, the, the last advance of the, the Wisconsin Ice Age. Warmer where? Everywhere. It was just, just Not warmer. It just wasn't freezing cold when the Younger Dryas started. Yeah. It became freezing cold, and the starting point right. was more right. or less mm -hmm. like it is now, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we were much closer to what had been a full ice age. Yeah. So gotcha. the ice hadn't melted yet. It would right. be just, you know, if, uh, like if the polar ice on the North Pole actually reached down to Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it plunged us in that cold period and then we, then we snap out of it, like right. you're talking about. And that was every bit as fast as the drop. Mm -hmm. And the, the Comet Research Group does not attempt to explain that. Mm-hmm. And you'll get asked questions on that stuff, and I'm happy to speculate because I'm a speculator, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But you can't explain everything. Yeah. And if you talk to those scientists privately, they say it's every bit the mystery right, that the right. beginning is. Yeah. And it it just strikes me, Matt. Somebody's got to make a movie out of the Younger Dryas yeah. event someday. Yeah. Because it, you know, you've got the three stage thing. You got the they they went from plucking pears to pulling plows. First of all, mm -hmm. so you've got kind of endpoint. And how did that happen? Humanity went from. Um, a period of actually there was wild weather back then, but we were, I guess you could say thriving as hunter gatherers and perhaps more advanced people. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we had that very, and, but the, 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 the weather was very turbulent. If you go look at the ancient temperature graphs, you can see that they spike up and down and up and down, and up and down. Then you have this big drop with the younger dryas. And there were other ones in the past as well, but this is a dramatic and most recent. But then when we come out of it, and we mm -hmm. warm back up, mm -hmm. it's relatively flat line since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't match any of the previous periods. So again, that movie kind of, uh, you would say the previous period, then you've got the big drama. And at the end, the sun rises and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. And God gave us another chance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that literally, it all came back um, very, very quickly. And we've lived in that very stable, favorable right. human climate. 
ever since the right. end of the right. Younger Dryas, with a right. couple of blips. Right, eleven thousand six hundred years ish. Of, That's right. Of That's when we weather. popped out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so it got so something happened. Something, yeah. something hit. Um, something hit somewhere, potentially multiple spots, and yeah. we have evidence of that all over the planet. And after that, after that impact occurred or multiple impacts occurred, we plunged into dramatically cold a period of time that lasted about 1200 years exactly and then at the end of that 1200 year period we see the temperatures shoot back up to where they right. are today about 11,600 years ago and we've still been enjoying those incredible temperatures that's right um, for that period of time but so the interesting part about that though is the sea level um, rise that mm -hmm. happened through that period so normally when you plunge into a dramatic uh, cold period. You would think that the that that you would have more ice on the on the, on the planet mm -hmm. in general, and that the and so the sea levels would be lower. Mm -hmm. The sea levels would be coming down. But what we have seen really since the last twenty four thousand years is the sea levels rising, but they were rising exceptionally fast mm -hmm. during the Younger Dryas. Yeah. And so the question is like, why? Do yeah, you, you got they call meltwater pulse one A and B. Yeah. If I yeah. get it right, I'm no, not a sea level guy particularly. Yeah. Um, but B was when we came out of it. Right. A was something that happened before that day. Right. Right. And that's why you know, and I'll drive the mainstream crazy with this, but it, uh, that's what we're we here believe for. there, yeah, <laughs> it, th there were multiple interactions. Yeah. That was a very, very bad day was something that had pestered us for quite some time and continued to pester us for quite some time and mm -hmm. can pester us by noon today mm -hmm. if we were so unlucky. Mm -hmm. Right. And what, <clears throat> what it is, is, and a lot of times, and this is getting a little bit geeky, but, you know, people speak of uh, meteors and asteroids and, you know, comets, and they kind of use it interchangeably. Yeah. But it's important in this respect to know that the Comet Research Group believes it was a comet. A comet. Okay. Yeah. Got and it. not a single comet, because we wouldn't be here, uh -huh. right? We'd have been the dinosaurs. Uh -huh. It was a fragmented comet. Uh -huh. And that is a phenomena that is very well known to us now, mm -hmm. that... I think we're tracking a number of them, and maybe we find them relatively frequently, say one a year or something. I think there was one last year where there's a comet in solar orbit that is fragmenting. Mm -hmm. And Ryan can pop up later or perhaps include in the video uh, that's Schwashman Walkman mm -hmm. is a good one that's going around out there now. Mm -hmm. And every time we get uh, a good view of it, it's disintegrated a little further. And they call that hierarchical disintegration, where mm – -hmm big piece turns into two pieces, two turn into four, four turn into eight, and it's just kind of breaking up out there, mm -hmm. right? Not as evenly as that, but basically that's what's going on. So they believe that a large 60-kilometer comet began disintegrating 20,000 years ago, mm. and then we crossed its path 13,000 years ago. But when I say cross its path, uh, Dr. Napier, who's a tremendous uh, uh, astronomer in England, learned a lot from, he said, George, it's, it's like you're crossing a highway twice a year. Mm -hmm. And that's called the, the, the one that we believe uh, the cataclysm uh, the came from was the torrid. Yeah. Exactly, the torrid meteor stream. Yeah. And we encounter the torrids in late June every year yep. and late October, mm -hmm. which is significant. Halloween. That's yep. right. And and Randall does such a good job with mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And what it is is it's like walking across a highway with a blindfold on, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That it just depends on the time of day. Yeah. Most of the time, you're actually going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to make it, you know, mm -hmm. from the period from midnight to 4 o'clock in the morning, you walk back and forth across that highway all you want. Right, right. But if you hit it during rush hour, you're going down. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And so we encounter it twice a year. Mm -hmm. And as you alluded to, um, the, the uh, entry, I'll give you two little tidbits, that the Tunguska event, mm -hmm. the thing that blew down a thousand square miles of forest that in was June, Russia. right? Yeah, it's yeah. June 30th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a torrid A. Could be. And yeah. then the fall torrids, and I think they're A, B. I think it goes like that. And then the torrid B is the one in the fall that um, – cultures around the world celebrate that week as a week of death mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and mourning. Right, and right. in fact, when the conquistadors came over as Catholics mm -hmm. and met the Aztecs, um, they were astonished to find that they shared with these, you know, this brute tribe in mm -hmm. the jungles, mm -hmm. the same week of death. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Right, right. Now the, 
How does that come to be? That's a shared experience. Mm -hmm. That's a shared cultural legacy. Mm -hmm. And I think they call it Dia de Muerta in Mexico today. Okay. And they've got their own version of Halloween. That comes, day, day of it, death. Day of the death. Yeah. 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 And, day of the death, and right. so that's what keeps you, you know, gets you way into this game. Right. Is when you say, oh my God, something like this could still be reverberating around in our culture. Yep. Yeah. You yeah, know? It's cool. And you say, well, why is that witch ride? Why is that witch ride a broom? Uh -huh. Well, what do they call the word comet? You know, it's for broom star. Uh -huh. That's what it's all about. You know, uh -huh. it looks like a, a broom coming out of the comet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. somehow or another, we put that spirit up there on a comet. Yep. You know, and their whole, you know, Randall does a two hour lecture on it that just blow your mind. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, but it's good stuff. And you start to see that kind of cultural things and say that. Wow, we really did remember this. We just don't remember why we remember it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the serpent, you know, is yeah. something that you see yeah. culturally all over the world, yeah. and you know, oftentimes they're holding a handbag, you know, yeah. the, the bringer of knowledge. But but what's but, a dragon? A dragon, a dra is, exactly. You yeah. know, yeah. is a, a a fire breathing thing with a big snaky tail. Right, exactly. And when you yeah. see a bolide come in. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. And it yeah. leaves the smoke trail. Mm -hmm. It looks like a giant snake in the sky. Mm -hmm. And it had a fiery head. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what a dragon is. Right. It's on the Welsh flag. Right. The Welsh flag, I, in my belief, is a cultural reverberation of encounters of this type. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We were traumatized. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Good, good Wild stuff. stuff. So that's yeah. kind of the, the Younger Dryas um, event. It, like I said, we've kind of come together as a comet research group and branded it like that just for the hell of it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, um, and it's being led now by Dr. Christopher Moore at the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And we've received a very significant bequest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The seven figures. Nice. Yeah. And that's floating the boat very well these days. Cause I okay. think for the first 15 years, if you toted it all up, we spent like 600 grand. Okay. And now we got more than twice that. Nice. So nice. we ain't going anywhere, buddy. Yeah, good, good, yeah. good, good. And yeah. the Wakala Springs paper is one of the first fruits of that. Okay. Of being able to have Chris work on this stuff full time. Okay, nice. And he is not woo. Right. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. And for good reason. I think he uh, yeah. kindly, uh, you know, would take a pass on the Cosmic Summit, even uh, though we do have Comet Research Group members there. Okay. But we don't want to mix these two groups up. Right, right, You right. know, you've got a team of PhDs that is out there on the very edge, hairy edge of science. Yeah. We don't need to try to drag them across the edge. Yeah, yeah. They've already got enough on their hands yeah. without getting into – Let's say Atlantis. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I mean, I mean, yeah. the younger Dryas as something that is woo. I think. I mean, we've yeah. got to be past that. At yeah, this yeah, point, yeah. I know? agree. I mean, it's like there's so much evidence of a just massive cataclysm. I mean, that's right. Look at the the black mat layers. I mean, just the, just the extinction event alone. I mean, of yeah. of, of all the megafauna across. Oh, the, it's a great point know? for yeah. people that aren't aware of this. Yeah, yeah. the the um, besides just the geological evidence. You've yeah. got uh, flora and faunal evidence and 200 species of mammals right. when it stinks. All gone. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Within that time period, not right. instantly. Right. Which, if 10% of the Earth's biomass is on fire, you yeah. know, that, that you know, makes some sense. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are some weird animals that, and people really got to get, the, 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 if you hadn't already kind of got the time on your head, and someone says 13,000 years ago, remember that's one five thousandth of the timeline to the dinosaur event. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. That is, this is so recent as to be today. Mm -hmm. You know, if you took a timeline and stretched it from Raleigh, North Carolina to the West Coast, mm -hmm. then the event and said that the dinosaur event, you know, is in San Diego at the beach or whatever, then the Younger Dryas event was at the, um, at the 7 Eleven. Mm -hmm. A half mile away in Raleigh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's it's that yeah. close. Yeah, yeah. And it's three times the timeline of the pyramids back. Mm -hmm. People were there, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so much more interesting than the dinosaur mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. is because people saw this. The dinosaurs might have been on another planet. They're interesting, right. but it's just another planet. Right, right. But this was our planet mm -hmm. when this happened, mm -hmm. and uh, in the blink of an eye. Um, so, yeah, that's an important thing to understand, just yeah. how recent it is. For sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that the, um, is, is your thought still uh, that the Carolina Bays were created at the Younger Dryas or do you now, are you now on the side of Davius and, and Chris Cottrell thinking that it's likely an older event? I've been agnostic for a long time Okay. and it was great to hand off the b- to, the con yeah. of those three, yeah, yeah, it was wonderful because yeah. I wasn't capable. Yeah. Of, I'm an obsessive, yeah. but they're really, yeah. particularly Davies and Zamora. Yeah, yeah. They're the kind of guys you need that yeah. are complete obsessives. Right. And right, then right. Chris is a wonderful communicator. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. and has his own anybody in this stuff is somewhat obsessive. Right. You know, right, so right. they're just a wonderful trio. Yeah. And then they disagree among yourself, among right. themselves, as you say. Right, right. Um, I don't know. I would either. say this. No, yeah, I have. Long, well, as Chris has said, Chris said was on very, your show, very convincing. Chris was very convincing that it was the older of the two dates. So I'll, yeah, I'll say that. and 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 uh, what was I thinking as I was listening to that podcast? Because I, I kind of, I, I am perfectly willing to separate it from this event, and mm-hmm. so did the Cosmic Comet Research Group. Mm-hmm. Not because any of us disproven; it's just poor evidence, mm-hmm. and it's controversial as hell. And you've got all this other stuff. Why bring that into court? Mm-hmm. That's circumstantial. Mm-hmm. When you've got forensic evidence, you know, that right. this is when it happened. You can't date the bays accurately. So how, if you do find the evidence, which we did find in them, could uh, – uh, uh, and I would think Davies and Zamora – or excuse me, Davies and Cottrell, I'd like to ask him, you know, why do we find uh, the cosmic geochemistry and spherules at the bottom of bays that happened 120,000 years ago? why would it be at the bottom that that bay just stay empty for 102,000 years or whatever it be, 108,000 years? And then it filled up with this material or actually was dusted with this material and then it filled up with sediment? I don't know. Mm. But I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic. Here's what I do believe. And that, what an awful thing to be in something 30 years and still not have a, a firm conclusion. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But um, I do believe they were all caused at once. Yeah. For and sure. that's a good starting point. Right. Because right. if they were all caused at once, suddenly, mm-hmm. then we need different explanations. Mm-hmm. And timeline is secondary to just what the hell happened, mm-hmm. and then we'll figure out when. Mm-hmm. Right? So, But the bays are the, the uh, kooky ant in the attic that they don't want to speak of. Right. Right. right? right. Yeah. And yeah. and Chris and, and Antonia and Michael do a great job of – very respectfully contacting people in, you know, the geo- geological community frequently. And the, it makes it very uncomfortable for those people. They don't have a good explanation. Yeah. Yeah. You right. know? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, it, it, you know, it's a riddle wrapped in an enigma. There's a lot of them. Box. There's a lot of them. That's why we yeah, can, man. that's why we can fill a podcast. Hell yeah, yeah man. That's the fun part. <laughs> yeah. That's the fun part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, that got me a younger dross event. And, and then I was kind of the, um, uh, like I said, the, I call myself the ball boy for the team, uh-huh. right? That you've got all these eminent scientists and highly skilled and PhDs and hundreds of papers and all this. And then you got a just old dude. And but but the ball boy knows all the stats. Yep. They know where the bodies are buried. Right. They got the respect of the team. You get to sit up front. Yep. And sometimes you make the credit. So that's kind of my role. Cool. And I was real proud of that, you know, because I was like, well, I'm with the scientists, so I'm not a woo guy. Yeah. But as far as we, let's talk Atlantis. Okay. Let's talk right. about what I call a right. precursor civilization. All right. All right. Okay. Yep. Well, those other guys wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole yeah. in writing. Yeah. You can't say the word Atlantis anymore. And, you know, and, and oh, no, no, no. 50 years ago is a different story, you know, as people were, were open minded to it as being a possibility that, there, right, that there was some, you know, type yeah. of a civilization. I know it made a big, you know, people were talking about it in the 60s. Yeah. You know, in, in Velikovsky. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there is some evidence. It's coming back, though. Yeah. It Things is. Things like that are cyclical. Yeah. In the Cosmic yeah. Summit, yeah. in our yeah. conversation, you yeah. know. Yeah. People right. are talking about it because it never goes away. Because yeah. Plato said in 300 BC that, you know, 9,600 years before my own time, everything went to shit. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and I mean, dead on with the younger guys. Yeah, yeah, dead yeah. on, yeah. you know, with yeah. the clothes or at least the, the second meltwater pulse. Mm-hmm. And um, that's just incredible to me. Mm-hmm. That alone. Yeah. Just says well, there's something going on here. There's something going on because yeah. I mean, just just with when you when you look at sea level rise rising 400 feet 
in in that time period. Yeah. You know, and you look back and you see a lot of the um, you see a lot of stone and like ancient structures underneath mm -hmm. the water. And so mm -hmm. you know there was something happening. I mean, there were people that were you know that were uh, that were alive and 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 using stone across the up across the planet. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, there are spots. And so I know some of it. You know, maybe it's not completely conclusive yet. But but that's like archaeologists haven't spent a lot of time diving and and underwater to you know to necessarily research this. But we are finding a lot of incredible stone. Structures. Yeah, I just came across there's something in Lake Van, the big uh, uh, Turkish lake, uh -huh. you know, that uh -huh. I think is at the foot of Mount Ararat. Yeah. Coincidentally. Yeah. They just found something beneath that mm -hmm. um, that could be very curious in another Gobekli Tepe, but more like um, um, uh, megalithic stones. Well, Gobekli Tepe is megalithic, more like building stones. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you're actually mm -hmm. building Blocks. something instead yeah. of just... Two pillars. Yeah, two pillars. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot more to come with it. Oh, what I was going to say is that, so I was kind of proud of being kind of sciencey and on this paper and other papers, and I got to be on other papers where I was able to help out. Yeah. But shoot, I don't have anything to lose. Right. So I'm out there wandering around. And, and and I'll tell you this, then I started my blog, if people are not aware of that, I have a blog called The Cosmic Tusk, and that's kind of my AKA on the internet, The mm -hmm. Cosmic Tusk. Mm -hmm. And I started that in 2010 because we went to a conference Um that normally when you have a new hypothesis and you have papers behind it, you're going to go present at conferences and give people updates and that stuff. So we were playing that game and it was rough and we were not <laughs> received well at all at these conferences. And then we went to one in 2010 that was particularly ugly okay. and it was like mean girls, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was so childish mm -hmm. that they wouldn't talk to you in the halls. They'd snicker. Mm -hmm. and all this stuff and here i am i took it hard and i don't even have a damn reputation you mm -hmm. know i was like these people are gonna be in fucking assholes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, what, and what was it that you were presenting uh we were presenting the younger dry's impact hypothesis wow. and updates wow. at the yeah. amqua american quaternary association uh -huh. in laramie wyoming uh -huh. university of wyoming that year and they treat us like a bunch of freaks yeah 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 and uh That's after hilarious. that conference the gang said um uh, you know, we, we're not going to do any of these anymore. This is awful. And that's when they started really coming out, not because we refused to go to conferences, but there started to be a lot of pushback on the hypothesis. It had kind of a honeymoon period. Okay. For instance, there was a Nova done, a one hour PBS Nova, gorgeous Cadillac of science TV, you know, did a fantastic thing in 2009 on the hypothesis that we published in 2007. And it was so it was kind of gaining gaining steam mm -hmm. in the mainstream, mm -hmm. and they'd have none of that. And they started coming after us with a lot of very very poor slapped together refutations that have been completely taken down by not just the Comet Research Group, by other outside people like Martin Sweatman, mm -hmm. has gone through and said these refutations don't hold up, particularly in light of the re-refutation when we answer back we always answer back with more information than they came at us with and we always began it with more information than they you know they'll write these five page things mm -hmm. like one of them said that the uh the carbon spherules that we find which are kind of anomalous they don't really know they seem to be related there's certainly abundance in that and, and then they came back and said well that's all bug poop in mm -hmm. one of the papers okay and you're like hold on man some of these guys are some of the world's top microscopists, okay? Yeah, yeah. We're using trans, uh, transmission electron microscopes and mm -hmm. SEMs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're not misidentifying biological material as pure carbon. Right. It is right. not sclerata or whatever. Right. You've got to, I mean, give us more credit than yeah, that. Yeah. But that's the quality of the of of the um, of the uh, people that that tried to undermine the hypothesis mm -hmm. and and bring them on as long as they play fair, but they don't play fair. So we went to that conference. They're coming after us. I said, well, man, somebody needs to stick up for these scientists or we at least got to have a stop where people can get primary information more or less from me and also have a voice that's aggressive and pushes back. And that's what the Cosmic Tusk was started in 2010. To nice, do. nice. And, oh, and then I say, and then I started transition. I got to know Graham Hancock and Randall. Mm-hmm. Right. And I started having a hell of a lot of fun on that side of things. Mm -hmm. If you will, the woo side, I don't know, call it the Atlanta side and the precursor, because mm -hmm. I don't have anything to lose on that. Yeah. And it was great. I'd already kind of built this great network of scientists. And then I built a, a, a really fun group of friends all around the world 
who are on the edge of this, who you've been having on this podcast. Right. Thank you, sir. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And we're building a fun. band of misfits yep. <laughs> all over the world. Right. And it includes a whole bunch of really cool subjects. We'll touch on some other ones today. Right. right. You Just know? exploring possibilities. Yeah. Like, man. what's wrong with that? Like, yeah. You know, it's like, it makes people so uncomfortable. People make themselves so uncomfortable yeah. when, 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 uh, when, you know, when you talk about new ideas and new ways and new possibilities for, you know, for, uh, for history and for, for reality. I mean, human beings have been on this planet for 800,000 years. Yeah. You know? I mean, for a minimum of yeah. 300,000, like yeah, that's yeah. like the minimum date with the job. Keeps getting older for, in Morocco. Yeah. It keeps yeah. getting older. Every the stuff just keeps getting older. But, but, um, but yeah, they I mean, sure didn't uh, do much with that brain for three or 400,000 years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's our brain. It's like the same brain. <laughs> yeah, they I mean, said, no, they could come up with anything better than rocks. Yeah, right. Not right. one group. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, one. not, not one group in, uh, in almost a million years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, is it possible that people have, have come together in, in some sort Sort of a civilization uh, in the past million years. I mean, that's kind of the question with you know Atlantis or whatever yeah. you want to whatever you want to term it. You and know? maybe they could be kind of a light touch civilization. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. And maybe they weren't that large. It's kind of funny. Right. The mainstream today wants us to shrink down to some light touch, right. nimble technological civilization that doesn't touch the Earth. Yeah. Hell, maybe we already had one. Yeah. Maybe we had a light touch gang, yeah. you know, back then that mm -hmm. made your vases. Uh-huh. Yeah, could be. Could be. Right. <laughs> and that's right. what they did with their technology. Yeah. And otherwise they just pluck pears. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Um Yeah. So what's your thoughts on Atlantis? Just prior civilization. Like, yeah, I know you you've you've done a lot of thinking on this. I think the cross cultural similarities, just the basic simple stuff you'll see on them uh Twitter and what other the handbags, for instance. Yeah. You know, and people not familiar with that, you can find the Mesoamerican cultures and the Egyptians and the Sumerians and all the Mesopotamian cultures. You'll find um, often depictions of their yeah. have a little bag yeah. with them. South America yeah. and, and Gobekli Tepe. And Gobekli Tepe, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The little things like that. Yeah. I mean, full stop, man. How do, how do you That's not that? coincidence. Right, right. You know, and I believe there was vast cross-cultural transmission of ideas and things over time, mm -hmm. whether there was one civilization that united them all mm -hmm. prior to them coming back in another iteration and presenting it as their mythologies and whatnot. Um, I don't, I can't be certain, but I do believe, I do believe there was a precursor civilization, but I also believe that there was contact between the continents mm -hmm. in one form or another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, with sea levels 400 feet lower, yeah. um, it's much easier to transnavigate the earth. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you're, you're able to, it's not like it is today where, you know, it's, it's that much more difficult. Like you could walk, I mean, yeah, the earth was much, had a lot more land on it yeah. that you could navigate much easier. Yeah, um, man. And all yeah. that's covered up and right. whatever they left behind there right. is right. probably still sitting there, but we're not yeah. we get to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had the good fortune when I was sitting there talking to Topping and Firestone, that was three of us. Mm-hmm that said, okay, we think there was an Ice Age comet 13,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then everybody you told after that, they were new to it. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's into the history of science, it was fascinating, man, because you're like, I think we're right about this. Will it, will it catch on? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I figured if it catches on, it'll take a year or two, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Yes, yeah, for sure. Right. About 2003 or four, yeah. like, this will all be done. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hell no. So you get frustrated <laughs> at the painfully gray, glacially yeah. slow progress yeah. that I witnessed, but it never stopped. Uh -huh. Not one oh. day. Mm -hmm. A little pedal here, create yeah. another pedal there, oh, cool. then it opened up on top of that. And, yeah. it moved yeah. and then it's moved all the way up the top so that the number one communicator on the planet, Joe Rogan, uh -huh. is 100% familiar with right. this subject, can right. speak to it at length, and yeah. invites guests on to talk about yeah. nothing but something me and Dr. Firestone and Topping that's were talking really about. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. the coolest thing to watch. Yeah, that's cool. But it still catches shit, just yeah. like it did that oh, yeah. one. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, it's just yeah. 50, 60 million people who are familiar with it right, now. So right, you ain't right. going to get rid of us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they could have yeah. snuffed us out at <laughs> yeah, that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Intellectually, yeah. not physically. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Three is easier than 50 million. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's pretty cool that that's how it started, though. And, and, and now that it has. Ah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, and I yeah. love history of science. And I, I hope one day this becomes a part of it. Maybe, you know, it all gets taken down or something. Yeah, but it, yeah. but it does move slowly. And it, and it seems to bring forward good people. Yeah. 
it yeah. seems to cough people up that we need at the right time. Right, right. You know? Yeah. It and just podcasting. makes so much more sense than, yeah. you know, than the than the traditional explanation of, you know, just everything's fine, you know, completely, no no, no catastrophes, nothing ever happened. You know, yeah. oh, we overhunted all the animals and, oh, don't worry about that black mat layer and, you know, don't, you know, don't, it's just. Uh, the overhunting yeah. the animals just kills me. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Because it's a politicized thing. The original guy on that is 1968 named Paul Martin. Yeah. And it's a political polemic uh-huh. that that uh-huh. was at the time they were first lobbying for species protection, okay. which is a, okay. uh, a, a, a dear thing to my heart. Yeah. I'm in species. Uh, I, I, uh, I actually sell prairie chicken credits. There are uh-huh. only 22,000 of them left. There used to be 22 million. Okay. <laughs> I believe in saving that species. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I don't mm-hmm. need it. And Martin came along with that modern conservation ethic mm-hmm. and then perverted a historical period in support of protecting species yeah. and bringing forth, you know, yeah. uh, he told that we are so rapacious mm-hmm. and we are so dangerous to the world mm-hmm. and we are so malevolent, malevolent, malevolent to our environment that we went and wiped out these 200 right. species right. of animals 13,000 years ago. And that was probably a good move. Mm-hmm. Dangerous Species Act. Mm-hmm. Past couple of years later, not directly because of that, but it was part of the part of the gist. But that's just not the case. Right. It might have been convenient politics, and right. it's also you know, and that's a great subject to bring up with people that are new to it because any hunter will tell you it's absolutely impossible. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that you can hunt a species to extinction, but that many and that large. And look at the other examples around the world. It's an insult to Africa. Right. They've been hunting elephants. For those entire 13,000 years, and they haven't managed to extinguish them as right. this one band of hunters did in North America, mm-hmm. supposedly, mm-hmm. you know, using spear points. Right. And hell, they've had shotguns for, yeah, right. And, and yeah. rifles for 150 years yeah. and hadn't managed and to try and, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and spear points. And you're talking about some of the most violent predators that have ever walked the earth. I mean, you know, yeah. the dinosaurs excluded. Who gets anybody, the last but, cave bear? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah While there's the, still yeah. another squirrel. Right. <laughs> Or another yeah. fish. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> and right. they tell you, okay, man, there's one cave bear left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 14, <laughs> 14 foot, 14 foot tall yeah, bear. He's with, in with the back a, of yeah. that cave. Yeah, We've killed yeah. two million of them. Right. <laughs> We've done a good job. Right, right. But you gotta go get the last one. Yeah, yeah. And who the hell eats uh how do you eat the last glyptodon? Yeah. How do you eat how do you eat two million cave bears w- w- after just eating what, how many millions of uh <laughs> mammoths? Ma- yeah, mammoths. <laughs> and like, yeah, who is that hungry? And humans were going for the bottleneck too at that point in time. But I mean, when you talk about like the the, the short faced bear, yeah. I mean, it's like three times the bite strength of a of a normal bear today. I mean, super agile, like like crazy Amazing predator, mammals. crazy yeah. predator. Like nobody is killing that thing with a spear. I mean, no. you, you know, that thing will eat you alive. I mean, you can bring a nine millimeter, you know, yeah. with, with twenty rounds into it, it's still going to eat you alive. Like, I mean, <laughs> you have no chance against that bear. And, uh, and I think of some more docile creature, the glyptodon, which is a gigantic armadillo the size of a golf cart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The well, hungriest person in Central and South America today does not eat right. armadillo. No, no, it's just not eaten. Right, right. So again, and you're not getting you, a spear through the back of one of the through an armadillo. Exactly. Either. I mean, yeah, yeah. Right. Who's gonna Who's gonna who kill can, the yeah. every single one of those? It's the stupidest theory I've ever heard. And and you think about like yeah. just just what the what the terrain would have looked like back then. You know, it's mm-hmm. not as if it's like you know flat plains and everything's cleared out. I mean, you're talking like jungle and forests and and you know like it wasn't like the human population was that big. But but to go through North America, and we haven't even mentioned like the the North American lion and oh yeah you know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah yeah like to have all of those things go extinct. But yeah. to try to find every one every last one of those animals and hunt them to the point of extinction in, in the forest and in the jungle yeah. and all across the entire continent. It's like... There were some most, birds that went down. Yeah, right. right I know you yeah. didn't get every single bird. Yeah. I know you can uh, with a pasture pigeon and the yeah. Carolina parakeet. You gotta have I really mean, good aim with those spears to yeah. get the birds, to, to get the birds extinct. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's pretty silly. Yeah, it it, it is. And I think that... Um, I think it's getting more and more difficult. At, oh, it has in the last 20 years. And then they start saying, well, it's climate change that took them out. And you're yeah. like, well, what the hell caused the climate right, change? Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, because those species had persisted and evolved for millions of years. Right. Right? There right. were dramatic swings. Right. And climate before then, every bit as dramatic as the Younger Dryas, in fact. Right. Um, right. Deeper in the past. And it didn't. Right. It didn't take them out. Right. Right. So something was special here, and that would have been a nuclear winter yeah. where it just got dark for a few years mm-hmm. and a lot of big things didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's actually what's left behind the black mat. Mm-hmm. The black mat, just so people know, isn't like the charred material okay. from the disaster. Okay. Although you find soot, you know, at the very bottom of it and all that. It's basically what that hellscape looks like, that it was a cold, wet, algal mat. Okay. Basically covered North America. Okay. Right. So- but and that wasn't from the, from. Well, from it was. The, it was a result of it of the burning. But the sign no 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 the signature of the black mat is mm-hmm. basically the algae muck nastiness change and it's not the burn material. Uh, okay, okay. Burn material is directly beneath it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's and cool. yeah, you find that uh, I think ninety percent of the paleo sites or so uh-huh. have uh-huh. that same black mat, and uh-huh. it used to be kind of a rule of thumb that when you got the black mat, that's when you're gonna. Start finding the bones, mm-hmm. and it's also where you're going to find the last of the Clovis points mm-hmm. or the Clovis points period because they don't go much further down stratigraphy. Some people say they're only here for two hundred years, give them two to four hundred years mm. to do all that damage. Mm. Um, I do think it's interesting that right after our first culture, well acknowledged, easy to describe uh, and, and 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 locate geographically culture. Um, came and then we had that cataclysm that's kind of creepy mm-hmm. yeah that's you know you'd gone a long time in north america without creating spear points then all of a sudden they get created and then boom mm-hmm. um it's kind of weird mm-hmm. but uh but yeah man yeah yeah pretty crazy yeah and i mean it's just it's constantly um changing and rewriting history just based on what we learn and that's to be expected but but so why do people just hold on to those dogmatic beliefs of, you know, this Mm -hmm. is the story. And we could evolve so much quicker if people were open-minded and and Mm -hmm. talked about things like we're talking about today. You know, it's like, it's like those footprints that we just found Mm -hmm. in, uh, what, New New Mexico, right? Yeah, White Sands. Yeah, yeah. 22,000 years old or so. And and it's like, uh, well, you know, those same people that were ridiculing you at that conference about the younger Dryas are the people who were saying absolutely no humans in North America prior to, you know, whatever, 12,000. 13,000 years mm-hmm. ago, uh, Clovis first doctrine. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the exact same people that wouldn't just laugh at you hysterically if you were to say that, well, possibly there, maybe there were humans here prior. And now we know. And uh, now they're rewriting that history. Now they're rewriting that and history. And now they're saying, oh, we were always open to it. Yeah, right. And, right, and, and right, it's right. like, no, yeah, you it's weren't. Like, man. No, I, no, you weren't. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. actually old enough to remember. Right. When right. it was pretty damn seriously Clovis first and period, and you were kind of on the nutty edge yeah, yeah. if you're going to talk about it. And yeah. now there's fucking evidence all over the all damn over place. All over the place. Man. All over the place. Yeah. 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 Campfires in the Amazon that are 30,000 years old, you know, yeah. carbon dated. I mean, there, was, there were people and there was stuff happening like all over the planet, you know? And so it's like, could, could at any time time in the last, uh, whatever, um, 300 to 1 million, uh, 300,000 to a million years ago, could at any point in time, could any of those human beings have come together and figured out how to make massive stone monuments, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe that's why we see the handbags all over the world. I mean, these are the types of questions that I think are important to, Mm -hmm. to talk about and to ask, but, um, yeah, so uh, that's the beautiful thing about podcasting, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's long. It takes a long form conversation, right? 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 And we're doing doing them all over the world, you yeah, know, on a yeah. great frequency now. Yeah, yeah for you sure. Know, it's for awesome. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah what else you want to talk about? Um, well, I mean, you know, there's a handful of topics. I guess. Um, I guess you know, as long as we're on the big kind of stone structures, um, do you have thoughts on uh, like the you know the ball beck and uh, you know, like when, when some of those stones might have been uh, made. I mean, it's obviously they're, they're credited to the Romans. You get a yeah. uh, uh, 1,650 ton stone, which is, you know, 3.3 million yeah. pounds, I guess, you know, and it's like, it's, it's over a, a million pounds heavier than anything that the Romans would have ever worked with. You know, it's right in the heart of that ancient civilization yeah. area. When you talk about Gobekli Tepe and the pyramids and, you know, all the underground cities and all of that, do you have, you have thoughts on, um, on that well it's a little bit like the um <clears throat> megafauna extinctions yeah you know that they write off say well the romans did that yeah and like oh hold on why the hell would they take a hinterland you know like lebanon was at that time that was important territory but it was a hinterland it was not rome mm-hmm. and use a construction platform that would have required greater uh, engineering capabilities than was it exhibited by anything 
in all of Italy. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't add up. But yeah. I, I also think it's so weird. And y'all just you just had uh, uh, good buddy Snake Brothers on yeah. last week. Yeah. And I love Russ's presentation at the Cosmic Summit last year was unfinished. And it's now again, this is just kind of like pointing out odd things. Who knows why? But the 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 stones at Ballbeck are unfinished. Mm-hmm. They're, right. the, and then it's like they dropped their tools, right. right? Or gave up, right? And then you go to the um, uh, the Aswan, yeah, obelisk, the unfinished, you know, yeah, obelisk, the unfinished yeah. obelisk, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's kind of dropped their tools, right? Right. right. And, what happened to make them drop their tools? And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily a catastrophe. I don't know, but it's just yeah. it's like their greatest works were left uh, unfinished to some degree. Yeah, for sure. You think we'd find a half a pyramid out there? You would think. Say, so. here's the one they didn't finish. Right. 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 Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, but uh, no, I love megalithic construction. I've been to Egypt three times. Mm-hmm. Um, I went with. Uh, Uncharted X, Ben Van Kirkwick, and Johanna James, and some folks in 2020. Mm-hmm. And my takeaway where I said, okay, because you always leave those adventures with more questions than answers. Yeah. I mean, that's a trite statement, but it's true. When you're flying home, you're like, yeah. I didn't much learn except uh, I've got better questions, and mm-hmm. i got more of them. Mm-hmm. But there'll be a few things where you're like, okay, I know this. Mm-hmm. And one thing I know is that the Assyrian and the Valley Temple – Beside the Sphinx Temple, mm-hmm. they were made by the same people, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're completely different than their surrounding structures that they're considered part and parcel with. Mm-hmm. And that's ridiculous. And then when you look at them and compare them together, you say, well, they fit each other perfectly. Mm-hmm. Whoever did this gigantic thing at the, at the Valley Temple and had these just massive blocks, same kind of vibe. That mm-hmm. you get at the Assyrian. Mm-hmm. So you know they're wrong about that stuff. Yeah. You don't, it's not like you have the answer and you can name the civilization and the date and the time. Right. But it's just clear as a bell. Yeah. Same thing with um with the Serapium. Mm-hmm. And you go down and see the big black boxes. Mm-hmm. And then you see on said big black boxes that somebody done a bunch of scribble scrabble. Right. You know, old hieroglyphic scribble scrabble. Right. And so how did they date those boxes? So how do I date that? Well, was that scribble scrabble? And mm-hmm. he's like, come on mm-hmm. now. <laughs> there is no way right. that the dude who built that box right. went and did that poorly yeah. scratched in chicken scratch. Right. They're never polished. The the, the yeah. hieroglyphs are never polished. They're always just, it looks like uh. a child did it compared to the uh. work of the actual statue itself. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Serapium's a weird place, man. I know you've yeah. got a, you're, you're going to be going to Egypt. So. Yeah. 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 For sure. That is yeah. We were really check that out. cool, man. Yeah, for sure. I hope they let you down below a uh, Saqqara. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need to just wait for it to go with Ben, and we'll get into all the great spots. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah couldn't, man. Couldn't, couldn't make it this year, but uh, but yeah, he uh, can probably get you in them from afar. Yeah, for yeah, okay. Yeah, you stuff okay. can. Yeah, okay, all you, right. You're you're in the circle. All right, all right. Cool. Yeah, when all Yusuf right. sees the the that he's probably watching these podcasts anyway. Yeah. All right, all right, but all right, uh, cool. when Yusuf sees that uh, uh, Matt Bell's coming over, all right, all right. there's going to be a red all carpet. Right, right. Now it might be an Egyptian red carpet, kind of tattered and yeah, old. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Got <laughs> but it. But they'll have a Got red it. carpet for you as long as they don't demand their vases back. Then we're, then we're good. <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been in the back of my mind. Uh, yeah, you want to talk vases for a minute? Maybe yeah, that's a segue. Man, yeah, man, I'm yeah. so proud of what you and Adam Young are doing. Yeah. And yeah. Adam's going to come to the Cosmic Summit. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, and talk vases. Cool. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. Yeah. And I find it to be a quantifiable thing, which they're, as everybody does, everybody finds it to be quantifiable. That's what's cool about it. Right, right. This is not uh, interpretation. Right. This is not, I find, like I just did, I find the Valley Temple in the Assyrian to be made by the same maker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What? Right. Okay. That's your, that's interpretation. Yeah. But when you take something from these are mysterious objects to now just in the last 18 months, we took a good look at them for the first time in man, you know, in human history, yeah. modern history, it turns out, no, they're just not cool and mysterious. They're, they're perfect. Right, right. Yeah, many of them are. And yeah. perfect is a hell of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> and, yeah. and, 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 you know, hand, handicrafts aren't known for perfection. Right. They're known for beauty. Right. They're known for utility. Right. They're known, you know, as artistic type things. Yeah. But they're not perfect. Right. Right. And that vase you have sitting over there is more perfect than any other 
item we've ever touched in our life. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And I just hand it to you guys. And I think it has put them to the extent that it's gotten out there. Because what happens when you really get something good like this is the loud go quiet. Right. 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 Yeah. And there's been a couple of debunking videos, you know, yeah. which everybody points to. And, and anytime I talk about uh, the vases on the on the show now, if somebody somebody in the comments will send a link to the debunking videos. And debunking is great, but it's like, what are you what are you debunking? I mean, so yeah. first, I'm just asking questions. Like, I want to yeah. I want to get some answers. Like, how yeah. is this possible? And and the only thing that the, the debunkers can really say at this point is, oh, they're fake. Like, you know, they, because, because they finally realized that the level of precision is so incredible that they must just be fake. And, and, and what, so, and then what the, 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 fake would be what? Fake would be modern made. That so, somebody went and took a piece of granite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Carved yeah. this right. with modern machine precision beyond our capability. There's been no one to come forth to say, "Hey, we can actually do this." If yeah. you give us a hundred grand, we'll make you one of these. Yeah. Yeah. That hadn't happened yet, right? Um, I don't know. I think that might be. Uh, Is I that think you might step? be able to get somebody in China to make you know some some granite vases for you? But you don't see that on the market, you know. And and you can't just you can't avoid the provenance, uh, right. Congress. You know, if if you just get one and and somebody in China makes it for you um, or or wherever. I mean, first off you need a five axis cnc machine you know yeah. you need a computer program to be able to make one of these things today yeah. um, but if somebody there makes it you know you don't have the you don't you don't have the provenance on yeah. these things. And so it's not just going to get onto the antiquities market. You know, you don't, yeah. you don't, it's, it's not possible. But it's not going to be perfect, is it? If someone makes a fake now, it would be kind of like the Serapian boxes. It'd just be prohibitively expensive to yeah, yeah, make one to put in this current market. I think you can make them relatively cheap, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think that you can huh. make them relatively cheap just out of a piece of granite. Okay, and this was an insight that you gave me earlier when we were speaking that yeah. you couldn't have done that. I didn't know it was relatively cheap, but we do know that the way that you would make it today, you couldn't do 30 or 40 years ago. Right, right, right. right, right you right, have right. to have a computer. Yeah, for sure, for right. sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and um, and you know, if you were to make it today, you would see different, uh, and I do think that I have one or two that are that are modern reproductions, sure. like out of the 54, I think that mm -hmm. one or two of them are, and you can kind of see that um, they don't have the internal tool marks first. I don't want to give the, uh, give away, you know, all of the different ways that you can kind of tell when they're real and when they're fake. Mm -hmm. But after you, after you look at, you know, 50 plus of these things and mm -hmm. you handle them and you see the similarities and the differences, you can kind of start to tell, you know, that these are genuine and the vast, vast majority of them are genuine. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, but when you, when you look at these things, like for, so for example, this one, um, you know, when you look at this is, this is, and I'm just introducing this today mm -hmm. on this show, this is brand new. So you're the first one. Oh, to, is it yeah, brand new? Yeah. So it's yeah. It's gorgeous. Man. Yeah. You're the first one to see this thing. But, um, but yeah, this was bought mm -hmm. at auction. It has provenance that goes back to 1960. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a receipt where it sold in 1974, I think mm -hmm. it was where, where you've got an actual receipt of sale in 1974. So you, you can't go back to past. 1930 because these were discovered at the step pyramid of Dozier. You know, they were all taken out of the ground, 40,000 of them, and mm -hmm. then they kind of made their way onto the antiquities market after that for the most part. But um, yeah, so this thing is interesting because it is incredibly incredibly symmetric it's incredibly precise um and you know i had ralph ellis on a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago and ralph was talking about the, interesting guy the, yeah for sure yeah he was mm -hmm. talking about the measurements of the um of the vases and we also in part two we we talk about the the measurements of the pyramid and 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 whatnot and that's super super interesting that that'll be out um in a couple of days but um but he uh, brought the uh, the fact to me that that when they were making these things, they were using the royal cubit, mm -hmm. they were using the the palm, and they were using the royal finger. Mm -hmm. And so it's like an ancient Egyptian system of measurement. And the royal finger is eighteen point seven one four millimeters, and the royal cubit it's not very big it's not very big it's less than two centimeters yeah 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 so and the royal cubit is 52.4 centimeters mm -hmm. so the cubit is like the elbow to the tip of the middle mm -hmm. finger so 54 centimeters and then you have a palm and you've got uh six or seven palms depending on if it's the royal palm or just the regular palm and then you've got four fingers per palm and that's kind of how they divide that up and so 
this one, and um, I think it was Isaac Newton was the first person to go and measure like the uh, mm -hmm. the king's chamber, and and we've been looking at the pyramids completely wrong, by the way. I mean, okay, we've been looking at them like in terms of meters and how many feet tall they yeah. are, and it's like oh, it's 146 feet tall, the Great Pyramid, or meters yeah. tall, and it's like that doesn't mean anything. It's it's 280 royal cubits yeah. tall, and it's 440 royal cubits wide and 440 royal cubits long. So yeah. it's and if you look at 440. Plus 440, the the length and the width, yeah. and and you divide it by the height, 880 over 280, and that is 22 over 7, which is pi. So yeah. it's a it's a pi based, you know. Yeah. And the dimensions of the pyramid are 345, which is a Pythagorean triangle. Uh -huh. You know, it's a Pythagorean triplet where three squared plus four squared equals five squared. You know, nine plus. Uh, Start to sound 16. like Malcolm Bendel. Yeah, 100. <laughs> percent Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the the fact that 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 the mainstream doesn't give the Egyptians any credit for understanding geometry, like advanced geometry, is just silly. And and they were clearly using cubits to design the the king's chamber is a perfect 10 by 20 royal cubits. So yeah. 52.4 centimeters times 10 is the length of the one wall and then times 20 is the length of the other wall. So yeah. it's like a it's like a square it's like two squares yeah. perfectly. If this was a modern forgery, nobody knows about the royal cubits to be able to, you know, to be able to to do this and to be able to make one of these things out of it. And when you look at when you look at the dimensions of these things, I mean, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. When you when you look at just the, you know, if you measure the, um, just in terms of how perfect of a circle this is, and you can't yeah. you can't do this with a primitive lathe, um, but you are at um, let's see, it's hard to do this by by hand here, but one hundred and twenty eight yeah. one hundred and twenty eight point three eight millimeters on that side. Okay, and then you you know you you redo your your calipers here. These are these are high quality precision calipers, mm -hmm. and you squeeze, and you are one hundred and twenty eight point three eight millimeters. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is dead nuts. Exactly, it's hard uh, enough to draw a circle, much less. Uh, Right. Shave a piece of right. granite into a perfect circle. right by hand with hand tools with flint chisels just yeah. pounding on this thing. You know this was two thousand years before the lathe. Before yeah. and and you can't do this with a lathe. I mean you, yeah. you, you the handle screw that up. But but you you can't you literally cannot do make this with a with a primitive lathe or even really a modern lathe. Like you yeah. need a five axis CNC machine to make this this artifact right here. And you can see you know the the tool marks on the inside how. They, yeah. They've cut out the the interior, and I haven't CT scanned this one yet because I just got it. But I know you can you can tell that the wall thickness is just perfect, just like the yeah. other spinner, and just like the you know you're going to have the exact same thickness of the wall from here to here to here, you know, all over the same the same area. Um, it's just it's just another the incredible, thin ones blow my mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, there's only there, there's only one that I've <laughs> seen. That's the thin walled granite. I mean, there are, you know, the red granite ones are incredibly precise. And then you've got a handful of other ones like this one that are not red granite that are extraordinarily precise also. Yeah. So it's it's really getting interesting on these things. And, and now I'm starting to measure the volume. Yeah. that they hold and I'm finding that there that there does seem to be a correlation with the volume that they hold in yeah. the ancient Egyptian system of measuring volume, which is the Hecat and fractions of the Hecat. Mm -hmm. um, a heck, it is 4.8 liters. And, um, and also the, um, um, again, all the dimensions as it relates to the measuring system, potentially the displacement, potentially the frequency. I'm mm -hmm. starting to look at the frequency of mm -hmm. these. But again, there's so many mysteries as it relates to these things and figuring it out. And well, I think, even if it was just the Egyptians. Yeah, yeah. That's unexplained. Give me a no, give me something else in the toolbox. Right, right, right. But I don't think it's the Egyptians. If I've read it all right, they're found in pre-dynastic graves. Yep. And some of those pre this I find is fascinating. I want to confirm it with you. That in those pre-dynastic graves, they'll find the more crude alabaster jars. Right. Which appear to be that they ain't that. Mm -hmm. They're easier to make yep. and they're more they're less perfect. Right. So you'll find the person who lived before the pharaohs in a grave with imperfect ones and then they'll have a perfect one or two mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. almost like they had gotten them from someone before themselves Very well and could be. even the pre-dynastic egyptians weren't making the perfect ones mm -hmm. but they were making imitations mm -hmm. right right and then buried right, right you know i guess they're prominent yeah dead yeah 
Right. And, and, and all we're saying, all I'm kind of saying is that's, yeah. a, that's a possibility. And yeah. I think that's all you're saying. That's a possibility. Hell yeah, man. And, and, and I hadn't reached conclusions around much no, in this subject. No, I just want to talk it all through. Right. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah. 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 I think that's worth like at least exploring that as a possibility because, um, because he, I mean, alabaster is a three on the most hardness scale. Marble, yeah. people always say, oh, with look, a pocket at, look, look at what you did with uh, the statue of David. Well, marble's a three as yeah. well. It's very soft, you know, yeah. very, very soft stone. But when, and it exponentially increases as you go. Is up it up, exponential? Up yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's not like just a stepping stone. Uh -huh. Like like diamond is like significantly harder uh -huh. than than other stones. But granite, like when you're talking about a seven and a half, you know, or seven like basalt in, uh -huh. in, in that same range, diorite, granodiorite, like all in that seven to seven and a half range, uh -huh. very very difficult to work with and to carve. And certainly, um, you know, I would say impossible to carve with hand tools. I would say that it, it it's. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I hate to take things to zero or to a hundred. Yeah skeptic or believer, but, yeah. but I will say that to make these, especially the precision one with primitive hand tools would be impossible. And that is, we have to remember that's the mainstream explanation for how these were created. All mm -hmm. of them, that they were created with primitive tools, but with like pounding on them with rocks. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't like, it was before the lathe. I mean, 2000 years before the lathe was mm -hmm. supposed to have been, um, you know, first used in Egypt, which, which was, um, 1300 BC. I mean, many of these are 3000 to 4000 BC. And so, you know, you're talking way before the lathe. And, mm -hmm. and again, the mainstream explanation is that they were just pounded on with rocks, take a handful of sand, you know, and, and to, to polish them. And that's how you get that perfect, like, you know, perfect polish that you would see on your countertop and, and granite. It's the same thing. So you think you would find more uh, or maybe perhaps they do. Have you found unfinished ones? Um, potentially. I mean, with arrowheads, you find perfect Clovis points, but you find far more Clovis points that aren't perfect. Yeah. yeah. Or, or they were the, what do they call them? Mm. Not the dubs or the, but, 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 but. I don't know. When you tried to make one, it didn't work out and right. you throw it to the side. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah, you think yeah. you would see some of that with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Where's the one where the kid's learning to make them? Right. And right. the apprentice. Right. And he goes, no, son, this is not perfect. Mm -hmm, Put mm -hmm. it over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You think you would find some of those, but it's like it, it's, a lot of this stuff, they pop up with an ability to make perfection. Not in all instances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's no... Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. And I think we need to, um, also recognize, and the debunkers use that, that, uh, the, the phrase, you know, that, well, this, it's not perfect. And so it's clearly done by hand. And so there's nothing to see here. And, and, mm -hmm. but, but I think what we have to realize is that they weren't always going for a circle. Mm -hmm. Like in, in most of them, the, the width, but underneath the handles is the diameter between of the distance between the handles just underneath is smaller than the diameter from front to back. And mm. so it's not a perfect circle. And so if you put it on Chris Dunn's device, when we went to Danville, you know, and we're mm -hmm. rotating them, you're not going to get a perfect circle, mm -hmm. but it's almost always that under the handles is skinnier than front to back. Front to back is fatter. And so pretty so clearly, deliberate imperfection, clearly a, a deliberate imperfection. And, and you uh, pointed out one of me, I, I wasn't aware that the, the, the um, handles tilt. Right, right. Yeah. Visibly. For sure. To the eye. Right, right. Something that's yeah. perfect in so many other respects. Right. The little nub handles. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's always the same direction that they tilt. If they're tilted, it's always the same direction. So sometimes the handles are perfectly flat and perfectly straight, you know, but sometimes they're pointed from, I think it's bottom left to top right is the way that they always shape the handles. And so it's deliberate. I mean, it's the why? same. Why? Right. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, but it's in, it's in every one of them, you know, so it's not as if you're just getting these lopsided handles and they don't know what they're doing and they were yeah. just eyeballing it. And the handles are always offset towards the part of the vase that is more visually appealing. So the handles are uh -huh. going to be closer together against the side that has some cool artifact in the stone, whether it's a line, you know, uh -huh. or something, something that just stands out. And so it's not as if they were intentionally trying to get the handles directly apart from each other. They wanted them closer together on one side and, and pointed in slightly for some reason. And so, and, and the bottoms are rounded in almost all of them, as I was showing yeah, you, you know, it's you, astonishing. You, yeah, yeah. You spin them. It's much easier to create a flat bottom, but to create a rounded off bottom like that, you just rub a stone against a stone to create a flat bottom. You know, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the easiest thing in the world. But but to create a rounded bottom where you reduce the friction, why would you do that if it's just a vase? If it's just a yeah. if it's just something where you want to put flowers in it and you want it to be sturdy and not fall over and, mm -hmm. and break, uh, you wouldn't round the bottom. 
be, you know, mm -hmm. there, there has to be some reason why you're reducing the friction on the bottom of the vase, potentially mm -hmm. um, making it easier for it to spin. Um, I, complete speculation because we have no idea. But, but if you want a sturdy something that's pretty and going to last, you create a flat bottom. Absolutely, yeah, man. hundred percent. So very strange. A lot, a lot of uh, mysteries with these I'm things. a big believer in kind of the wisdom of crowds, but not the collective wisdom, although there is such a phenomenon, yeah. right? Yeah. And, but more like, and I, I think we're going to deal with it on increasingly frequent basis, that if there are, Let's say it's a, some obscure field, mm -hmm. and there are 10 top scientists in the world that are fully credentialed in that, known for it their entire careers, and worth hearing from, mm -hmm. <laughs> no doubt. Mm -hmm. The other 8 billion people are going to have about 100 people who don't have the credentials who actually know every bit that they know, mm -hmm. right. one way or another. Right, right. That they're autodidactic. They studied it themselves, mm -hmm. and they're sitting in Thailand and actually know more about uh, – um, uh, ancient Indian, you know, ancient pottery than mm -hmm. someone would. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever, whatever the subject may be. And we see that. And the reason I bring it up is I think you want to smoke those people out. And in this case, it's not necessarily, certainly not probably finding experts in ancient antiquities, although they're helpful, but y'all have already done it with like Mark Vist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where the somebody gets coughed up by mm -hmm. the internet. Mm -hmm. And they're incredibly intelligent and have the right understanding. And they're as amazed by this, you know, as you are. It's like, um, well, I guess you could say it works in reverse too. But now we're Ra definitely. Ra Ralph Ellis is another great example of somebody that, that you know, just happened yeah. to stumble upon it and, and, and realized that, hey, if these are, are real, yeah. they're probably using an ancient Egyptian form of measurement. And so, yeah. he, you know, to be able to plot that. But, but yeah, he's, he's a. Yeah, he was super helpful pushing this thing along. And there's other people out there that are listening right now that are going to be like, well, have you thought of this? That's you know, what I'm thinking, man. Yeah, and I think yeah. a website, Yeah, you need to wrap a website around them, Yeah, yeah. right? And have yeah. one go-to place where, yeah. because now it's watch the videos or go read Mark Fist's page mm -hmm. and see if you can collect the best hypotheses mm -hmm. for the understanding of several different things, the mm -hmm. math behind them. What mm -hmm. is the importance of the math? What is the uh, relationship of the measurements to ancient measuring, mm -hmm. et cetera, and so forth, which you've gotten to the bottom of. But I, I just, I, I really think that the, 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 that you can find people out there that can assist you with the studies that are non-academic, that will have tremendous insights that even the academics want to have. Yeah. Yeah. That Mark this is a great example. Right, right. I mean, this is just ripe for it. Yeah. A math guy could go at it. Yeah. A manufacturing type could go at it. Mm -hmm. An artist could speak to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. 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 We're working on a website actually. Are you? So yeah, good. yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Yeah, Ryan. It'll be a beautiful website. It yeah. also lends itself to a beautiful yeah, website. It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, but but you're right. Um I should have as much information possible about each of the artifacts in terms yeah. of like dimensions and, and volume and resonance and you know everything. And provenance. Provenance, right. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. you're getting provenance tomatoes thrown at you. No no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And you'll say, well yeah, that's a yeah. fact. But here's my provenance. Right. Some have great provenance. Some have absolutely Right. Indisputable providence. Right. And some right. have none. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like most yeah. artifacts. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, actually, most of them have, have pretty good. Do I they? Mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to make their way onto the antiquities market if they don't have like something. Yeah, something. Like, I don't know where. Um, you know, at least on the ones that I'm buying, like I, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're coming from reputable places, reputable, either antiquities dealers that are well known, mm -hmm. you know, or auction houses that are, you know, they're not going to sell fakes. Like if you talk about, you know, um, I don't want to list the name of them because then I'm going to have competition for getting these things in 2024. Yeah. But, which but, I would imagine yeah, is an yeah, issue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think honestly, 2024 will be more about the research. 2023 was spent, you know, trying to try get a to, stable level. Exactly. You got a Right. beautiful stable oh man. thank you yeah appreciate and that. i i think the website too would allow people you know the geeks that are following this like me you're like wow he's got a whole table of them yeah yeah and yeah. i know that table is growing right all the time right yeah. and you see them all but you don't until we went through them before the show mm -hmm. and and handled them and looked at them and talked it through i didn't appreciate the diversity yeah 
Right. The little tiny black one that's kind of squeezed yeah. like that. Yeah. That yeah. still has its little handles. And yeah. The little tiny yeah, handles. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> and that, yeah. that's a hard as rock. How do you do that? Right. right. And yeah. still make that little tiny handle. What are you sitting there with your copper chisel? Just. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Mini, mini bow drill. Mini yeah, bow yeah, drill. yeah. 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 Just, yeah. 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 Uh, oh yeah. gosh, man. So get it out there. You've got a great stable. It's going to be fun to watch. I've only had, here I am like, do this, do that. You yeah, know? yeah. And you're only, what, a, you know, a year and 18 months or yeah, so yeah. into this. Yeah. No, There's I'm, so I'm, much. I'm, I'm 12, yeah. mo- 12 months in basically. Is I, it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I start. I started the first time I saw that I, that I had heard of the, yeah. uh, pre-dynastic vase, um, situation, whatever you want to call it was, was Ben Van Kirkwick on the Joe Rogan show. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I check uh, out, yeah, I check out Joe Rogan here and yeah. there, you know, like, uh, you know, when, whenever Randall comes on or whenever, uh, you know, uh, Graham Hancock comes yeah. on. And so, so Ben and Jimmy, uh, had gone on and, and yeah, that episode totally, you know, just blew me away. Just completely opened my eyes to this. And Ben and did a fantastic amazing job. job. Yeah. He always does. I mean, he, he's, he's yeah. the greatest man. He, he's he really so much is. fun to travel with and I yeah. so much recommend his tours. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. they're filling up quick these days. Yeah. Yeah. Was, but yeah. it's a, there's, a special period right now when you can go to Egypt with somebody like Ben who five and ten years from now yeah you're probably just right. not going to be able to go sign up and right. go travel with him. Right, right, right. And we went to Turkey this year, mm-hmm. and that was just fabulous, mm-hmm. man. Be mm-hmm. over there with the snakes and stuff, and that's available yeah. to everybody listening to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. You can go on that. They're not terribly expensive trips. Right, right. Um, But, boy, they're fun, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah we saw sure. some weird stuff in Turkey. Did you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You got to tell me now. Well, <laughs> you uh, open the can of well, worms. Well, I open myself up and stuff. I was going to bring him up in some other respect, but you know, I've gotten drawn into this maelstrom of technology and um, Malcolm. Are we going to Malcolm? history? Yeah, and Malcolm Bender. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's a good segue. Okay. <laughs> and hey, this will be actually a good thing that I can send some follow up imagery. Okay. 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 Perfect. And people perfect. haven't seen this, and I haven't discussed this aspect. I've talked about Malcolm plenty on a couple of recent podcasts. One I did with Robert Temple last week, which came out my podcast, The Foxhole, and that published this morning. So okay. I recommend people go see Robert and me and Randall. Mm-hmm. Randall came on as my sidekick. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? That's pretty awesome. So we could interview Temple. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. And it was funny because I sent him a text like ten o'clock night before. I said, God, I forgot you're reading Temple's book. I'm having him tomorrow. Uh, it's at 10 o'clock if you get this and Randall's not much of an early person mm. and damn if he didn't call me up five minutes before we were going to start recording he said oh, oh did I miss it you know, <laughs> I was like no jump on yeah, jump on yeah, you cool, know cool. it was awesome and we talk a lot about Malcolm Bendall there yeah. I was also on Demystify Psy, uh-huh. which is a wonderful podcast I recommend. Yeah. I was on that about three or four weeks ago, and I talk about it extensively there. So people, if they want to hear the whole crazy story, they can. Can you give a quick background? Yeah, as to- yeah. Bendall um, is the fella that uh, 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 Randall name dropped on Rogan mm-hmm. in October of 2022. Mm-hmm. And I was aware of the fellow through Randall at the time. And like a lot of people, I was kind of concerned. I was like, well, Randall, man, cold fusion ain't your thing. Mm-hmm. And actually what I told him, I said, look, man, I got a lot of interest too, but you can only have one crazy idea at a time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And you're actually riding two already. <laughs> right, right. You're right. riding, you yeah. know, catastrophism and sacred geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. With a you kind really of really want to add a third with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah right. It's physics, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um. So I warned him against it, whatnot. And it's fine because I got drawn in the damn thing too. Mm-hmm. So I'm about to recount. So then he goes on name drops the 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 secret fella, and I love the story. There is like uh, apparently maybe this is a little apocryphal at this point, but the way I first heard it, I got to check with Malcolm. But he name dropped him, and the damn president of the damn Maldives called up Malcolm and said, "Listen, man, we can keep you quiet, but we cannot keep you loud. You got to go, buddy." Uh-huh. And he'd been living on his island. Mm-hmm. Okay, and if anybody that meets Malcolm, Malcolm, you'll immediately become aware that he has spent years upon years, seven, yeah, seven years for sure, as the story goes, alone on an island in the Maldives because he can, um, his understandings come more easily, if you will. Okay. Okay, when he is uninterrupted by the hubbub of civilization. And that's mm-hmm. been true for saints and sages throughout the years. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, I met the guy, 
And we go down to go on Rogan with him. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually, uh, Randall was nice to invite me to go down to Austin with him next month when he's probably going to go on again next month or the month after. And Uncle Drive down there, sit in the green room again. You can't get too much of that. It's fun as hell. Mm -hmm. But we went down there with Malcolm. But Malcolm Bendall um, possesses knowledge that may be very important to us all with regard to plasma technology and the creation, if you will, of microscopic ball lightning. Okay. And if people are into anomalous subjects, you've probably come across it, but there's a phenomenon known as ball lightning, which has always been quite mysterious okay. because it suggests that plasma, which is um, uh, protons, neutrons, and ions or whatnot, you know, unassociated uh, 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 particles, you know, it's not an atom yet. Mm -hmm. You got the, the pieces of atoms in there, but they're not atomic yet. And ball lightning appears to be a self-organized, coherent plasma structure that's keeping itself together. Mm. Well, why is for, that for of interest? For a short period of time. Yeah, out, for a short out, period out of time. Out in the open. Yeah, uh, out in the open. Yeah, yeah. I've never said this before publicly anywhere. I've actually only told my wife and double-checked the guy, but I actually saw it once. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. I just thought okay. it was kind of a little creepy if you're getting to this thing. Go, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, You yeah. know what I mean? I hate yeah. people do that. Where'd you see it? I was about 10 years old, and I called the guy who we had a sleepover. He was my old best friend as a child. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually, when I was thinking about bringing this up at some point, I said, I got to call Walter and see whether he remembers that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, does he remember what I remember, which was we were sitting around watching TV during some horrific thunderstorm, mm -hmm. and a damn ball of light about this big came through the window, wow. floated through the room, and blew up. Wow. It went boom, and you got a whole nother boom. Wow. That's crazy. And we were like, so I, I was like, is this some kind of one of those recovered memories yeah, or yeah, whatnot? Yeah. You yeah. know, maybe I read about that shit as a kid. Yeah. And, and I called Walter. He goes, yeah, I remember that. Huh. Okay. It was just you, got, you get, just you two sitting in the room? <laughs> yeah. Wow. We were just little, wow. little kids, you yeah. know, parents yeah. probably out partying in town or something. Yeah. We're just sitting out there in the country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn ball light and throwing, flowing through the room or yeah. floating. And um, yeah, so I actually saw it. But see, there are uh, experiments, if you will, you know, you've seen them if you pay any kind of attention to this stuff. They're gigantic plasma containment machines, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly the Tokamaks in Europe, and there's one in Japan, and all of these are billion dollars plus, and the world has collectively spent something like 50 to 100 billion, maybe even more, on trying to do what nature seems to do with ball lightning. Mm -hmm. And that is maintain that plasma structure mm -hmm. because theoretically you can get an over unity return of energy. You can get more out of it than it's being put into it. You can get nuclear type returns, okay. uh, fission type returns, but mm -hmm. through fusion mm -hmm. with um, without an explosion because mm -hmm. a, a H bomb is a is a fusion experiment itself. So is there a byproduct? Uh, no. Okay. No. Okay. So it's yeah. it's pollution free energy. Okay. And so there are these gigantic contraptions out there that they've been trying to pull this off with. And uh, people through the 20th century said, we can do this or I can do it. And Malcolm gives credit to a number of people, which I thought was impressive right off the bat because he's a strong personality. Mm -hmm. And he's a big fan of Malcolm, just as we are. Mm -hmm. And But he's also a big fan of his predecessors and gives them credit first. Mm -hmm. And that's Nikolai Tesla. Mm -hmm. And people have been speculating that for years. What was it Nikolai Tesla knew that we never got a hold of? And then the Trump's uncle swept up all the papers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and and they ruined him and all that. He gives credit to Tesla. Uh, he gives credit to, uh, uh, these are more obscure people, Winston Bostick, who was a plasma researcher, okay. and Ken Shoulders, and then more kind of prominent people that are kind of weird, you know, like uh, there was a guy back in the late 80s, early 90s, and I remember it, man. He used to go on... Um, like, uh, that's incredible. His name was Stanley Meyer, mm. and he had the high, the the fuel, the uh, water powered dune buggy. Okay. It just sounded like the biggest bunch of bullshit on earth. Yeah. And there's no reason Malcolm should include him in the list. If you were trying to pull something off and he didn't really have this, why well, throw in Stanley Meyer? But he goes, no, nah, Stanley had it. Mm. Okay. All right. And Stanley met an unfortunate end. He had a business meeting in the morning at Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. He took a sip of his cranberry juice. Uh -huh. He shot up out of the table, ran to the door, screamed, I've been poisoned, and mm. dropped dead. Mm -hmm. And the two Belgian businessmen that he was having business with were never seen again. Mm. 
Wow. I mean, that's a weird one there, man. Yeah, Somebody sure. claims to have licked all this stuff, and then he right. dies at a cracker barrel and screams, I've been poisoned? Right, right. Yeah. I've weird heard, stuff. I've, I've heard that that with a lot of – and I don't know yeah. how much of this is just pure conspiracy yeah. theory, but but I've heard that there's been like at least 10 or 12 people that have been working on on clean energy yeah. that, that have like – that have created these devices that supposedly work that have just – been died mysteriously absolutely and, and, the, and i did know the story about that guy's being one of them but, yeah. but but there's multiple others from what i understand yeah they didn't do paul pantone any favors man they locked him up in a loony bin in utah uh -huh. Uh -huh. about 10 years ago that was a more recent one uh-huh and he was close to it i don't think he had the deep understanding as some other guys but there's some tinkerers out there yeah yeah they've come across this stuff because it's not that complicated malcolm's machine yeah just kind of uh cut to the chase and yeah. we'll, we'll bring it to turkey that's how we got started on malcolm but yeah okay. had some insights on turkey but malcolm's machine is um a retrofit mm -hmm. of something now you say and, and if you look at the retrofit engine which is a generator engine uh that you can buy at lowe's and there are these honda generators i forget the cc i'm not a good mechanical or physics person but it's like 349 cc's or something like that they're pretty standard they look like a power washer Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Engine that bag. And they'll run off of propane or kerosene or natural gas, but we run them off of petrol, you know, off of gas. Mm -hmm. And then Malcolm retrofits it with an assemblage of new parts. The total cost of the whole thing is $1,400 to $1,500. Okay. The, the, the engine generator is costing you $900, and you got to get about five or $600 other, dollars other parts. And then... Um, after we went on Rogan, I stayed in good touch with Malcolm. I hope to be able to test him machine myself. And that one coming together, and then all of a sudden he popped up and said, I'm going to Tesla Tech, um, which none of us had ever heard of, and I'm going to demonstrate the machine. So mm -hmm. everybody goes and looks up Tesla Tech. Oh, my gosh, there's an old, obviously, Tesla fans conference, but it's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then you look at the kind of people that go to it, and they are – uh, advanced propulsion people, aeronautics people, mm -hmm. engineering, uh, aerospace, and many of them worked at uh, the labs in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and a certain number of them worked on black projects, but they're retired, and they want to see this stuff come forward. Either some of them perhaps even know it's out there, but but they, a lot of them have suspected. So the average age of the conference is north of 70. What impressed me when I first went to it is it's been going on for 50 years. They've been having this conference, which I thought, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And as somebody's doing conferences, I can't imagine having the same crowd come back 50 years later. So Malcolm takes it to Tesla Tech, and it worked. Okay. And I see it working. And then the next day after I saw it work the first night, I started meeting the people who had put the machine together for him who did not know him. So there was a group of people who'd been kind of alerted that this fellow was coming to town. And that he needed these pieces and parts. And then he'll get to town and you guys will all put it together. Okay? And then you'll put in the key part called the thunderstorm generator. Okay. So you've got the bubbler, you got the UV light box, and the thunderstorm generator. The thunderstorm generator is the only part you can't make from Lowe's in three days because you've got to weld it okay. and preferably anneal it. Okay. But that ain't that complicated. Is and that it, where the plasma is maintained within the yes. within that part? Okay. Yeah. Actually, the plasma, the plasmoids, plasmoids, yeah, are made in the bubbler. Okay. Then they're tuned in the UV light thing. Okay. And then they are employed in the thunderstorm generator. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. So there you got the, you know, regular old engine. Then you got the thunderstorm generator, which is basically just welded metal. There's no moving parts. Yeah. And that exploits a process known as vortex tubes or Venturi tubes or Rorschach tubes. And that's yep. when you take uh, a hot gas, you can split it into hot and cold. And the hotter is hotter than the gas that came in, and the cold is cold as shit. And mm -hmm. it's just kind of an amazing process. And mm -hmm. Malcolm's got some twists on that. Okay. A little too deep for me to quite get my brain around, but it's simple stuff. And he puts all this stuff together, and it eliminates the, um, the pollutants. It has no more hydrocarbon emissions. It completely eliminates, and I've seen this dozens of times now, uh, the carbon monoxide inevitably. Mm -hmm. It finds that very easy. 
Mm -hmm. It knocks off CO2 when running well, which is a state you can get it in, so it would stay there at least 80 or 90%. Mm -hmm. So that, that'd be helpful these days. Yeah, that'd limits. be all right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then your uh, free hydrocarbons just that are just floating around, mm -hmm. uh, it takes that to zero every time. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things we were marked on in Albuquerque, after it worked, everybody was like, holy, because these guys have been watching free energy schemes rolling at Tesla Tech for 50 years. Yeah. And they were like, this is the best thing we've ever seen. First of all, no one brings the machines. They'll bring a mock-up of it. Mm -hmm. They'll bring PowerPoints, whatever. But nobody brings the actual machine and says, hey, watch this mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And then you wouldn't expect them to leave you with it and mm -hmm. go get lunch. Right, right, right. <laughs> and you're sitting there manhandling the thing. You yeah. know, it's it's yours for all intents and purposes. Yeah. And, but one of the first things we noticed in before, uh, I guess, before we had the exhaust analyzers, which are a key part of it, hooked up, is somebody in the loading dock that was closed on, you know, four sides or three sides, open on one. When we'd been running the generator without the tech on, it stunk like an engine is running inside of a room. Hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then somebody remarked after the tech was on, on one of the first few tests, they go, hey, it doesn't, doesn't smell, smell any in here anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And your nose is a pretty damn good detector of hydrocarbons. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, but you're not using your nose to, to detect the emissions. I mean, you guys had sophisticated equipment in yeah. there to detect the emissions. Really good equipment. I've yeah. seen seven different analyzers hooked up to it. Okay. One of which got borrowed by a friend of mine from a very established research institution. It had nothing to do with Malcolm. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, if this guy's faking it, all it could be is he's hacking this device that he's using called a cane analyzer. Uh -huh. And I've come to understand why we use the cane. It's actually the best, cheapest, most appropriate one. But you can hook up all sorts of different analyzers. Yeah. And I've seen six of them hooked up to them, and they show the same results every damn time. Okay. And it eliminates the emissions. And so Malcolm got revealed – there then he went and we went down to rogan so he could speak on road you know yeah. rogan wanted to have him on but basically you're talking about yeah. you're talking about a device that you can hook up to vehicles you're talking about like like this thing could be retrofitted onto cars for example and completely eliminate emissions not just eliminate mm -hmm. emissions but convert emissions into oxygen that's is, a, you're is following along with this stuff yeah. that's right yeah okay. because what it does it doesn't just eliminate the emissions it maintains or reachieves it'll drop at first then it bounces back up mm -hmm. to 20 percent um, oxygen, which is atmospheric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the only way that can happen is that you're transmuting the elements. Yeah. You're taking the nasties and turning them back into oxygen. Right. And, and so if this is real, mm -hmm. I mean, and, um, and there have been scams in the past, Absolutely. And, you know, for, for sure. Um, but I know that this one has been tested and analyzed and repeatedly tested and continues to, to show just incredible results as if it's, it's working and you're using, you're using sophisticated equipment to test and to, to measure that, that yeah. it is truly working. Um, if it's really working and if it's really doing what Malcolm says it's doing, mm -hmm. I mean, this is the biggest discovery in, in the history of mankind. That's right? what made it a weird year, my friend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it started January 15th and it's been exactly a year or so. Yeah. And it's just been crazy. Yeah. I've been yeah. all over the world with the machine. Yeah. I've been to London to see it. I went, we went and did another uh, very much Tesla tech type public demonstration again in Zurich. Mm -hmm. Went over there with my wife mm -hmm. and we actually brought the thunderstorm generator with us. Because it was fabbed in Hawaii. Okay. Malcolm doesn't like to mail it. Yeah. But they did mail it from Hawaii. Then he wanted me to take it across the Atlantic. So me and my wife had this, it's not a secret, but like yeah. the, the most important device in the world, <laughs> if all this be true. Right, right. You know, in our checked luggage. Yeah. And of course, they tore it apart in JFK and wrapped a bunch of tape yeah, around yeah, it. Yeah, probably yeah. sent the pictures to Homeland, of, you know, <laughs> Homeland right. Security. Right. And so we get it over there to damn Zurich and it works. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, interestingly enough, a lot of people miss this part. Well, let me preface this real quick. Malcolm, this little rinky-dink thing, you're saying, well, God, if it's the greatest discovery ever, you think it looked better than a power washer. But the whole point is Malcolm appears to have understandings of things that can do about anything. Mm -hmm. Like you have opened up the door to physical and dimensional manipulation. Yeah. Okay. So if you've got all that knowledge and you're a guy like Malcolm, how are you going to show it off? Right. You don't necessarily have all the funds to build the first time machine or to go build the warp drive right now. You know, you <laughs> got to do something Yeah. and you've got these physical understandings. Yeah. So 
according to Malcolm, the CIA told him <laughs> eight years ago to do this. They said they wanted a non-polluting engine. He said, well, I can take it to the stars. I can do mm. this and that. Y'all know that. Mm -hmm. And said, no, 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 no. We'll buy the guy. Oh, I can make it run forever, mm -hmm. which is very much on the table. And he said, I can make it run forever. And they said, no, Malcolm, we said just make him a non-polluting engine. We got the gas. We'll pay for the gas. Mm -hmm. We just don't want any emissions. I would mm -hmm. think it would be for subs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Malcolm did it in four months and came back with this rig. Mm -hmm. And that rig has been running in England for eight years, on and off, mm. yeah. and under great secrecy. Yeah. And I've met all those people yeah. now, and they're no longer secret, probably some of their chagrin. And so they've been running that thing, and some of them became very interested in it, having seen the mir miracle for seven or eight years. And they have built one, if you will, Ryan, go to the Alpha Prospects website. Okay. See, they went and they, they've now hooked that one up to the grid. Okay. Land Logic at one of their methane generating power generation methane landfills. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that that setup is inside the M25 in London. And that means it has extremely tight carbon monoxide limits. So if you're right. running that business and making power and selling it to the grid, your limiting factor is your permit. Mm -hmm. It's not how much methane you have and how much electricity you can make with it. Mm -hmm. They could make, I think I heard four times as much if they didn't have the permit, okay. but everybody follows the rules, right? Yeah. But if you hook up Malcolm's thing, you eliminate the carbon monoxide and you make all the damn energy you want. Yeah. And their yeah. regulators agreed. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. And it, the interesting thing is it, that, they hooked that thing up. That would cost at least a million dollars to build this thing. The thunderstorm generator part that Pam and I took to Zurich has to be moved with a crane, right? Yeah. And people putting their money where their mouth is on this, mm -hmm. and we're going to know sooner rather than later. Yeah, we're going to find out if yeah, this is Yeah, we're going to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And I could end up with a tremendous amount of egg on my face, but I just can't figure out yeah. where it's coming from yet. But it's worth it. And I, I got mean, nothing to lose. Right. It's it's worth no, it. No, I'll come back and tell everybody what a chump I feel like, but yeah. I got another new idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. But if it is, I mean, if there's even a 1% chance of yeah. this being real, then it's worth it to go through this process to to try to figure it out and to try to move humanity forward, you know? I mean, That's right. It, yeah, and, and if it's not, then, you know, so what? And Malcolm's like, a quirky character. Yeah, and no a doubt. lot of people say, well, he's just so quirky. And you're like... Yeah. Well, listen, sometimes God delivers beautiful presents yeah. in strange looking boxes. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't imagine Nikola Tesla was a run of the mill type dude. No, no, no. But for he sure. did. We still run our appliances on his idea of how right. to provide energy. Right. Um, Alternating current, right? That's right. Yeah. And Malcolm, um, I think he's one of those cats. Yeah. You know? yeah. And he didn't want to be public yet. And then he got public, and so this has all been kind of slash, you know, uh, slapdash year. Mm -hmm. um, then we took it to India, and I got back from India about, I don't know, uh, right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Went over there, showed it to a conference of 75,000 technologists, mm -hmm. and they were all over it. We had a crowd of 20, 25 people at all times okay. around the machine. And that machine is actually still in India, and it is working very, very well. And then there are a number of other devices uh, that are going to come forth relatively soon. Right? So, what are next steps? Like with what, that? Well, well, with with just the project in general. Like, well, yeah. like how do you get it to um, how do you get it to adoption? Like, or yeah. I, I know that there's so that might be five steps down the road. But what's kind of like how do you guys see the plan rolling out over the next you know whatever twelve months, thirty six months? Yeah, what you don't do is take it to the car companies. Yeah, okay. Because they already tried that. Okay. And I actually saw the paper on that. And I won't mention which company it was, but they were very excited to have it tested in a... I think like, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Randall mentioned it on Joe Rogan's show, I think. No, no, not that oh, one. Oh, not that one. Okay. This was one that was going to test it for them. Okay, got it. And they were going to test it at a European facility, but it was an American company. Okay. And I was waiting on this test. You're going to get the serious test from the best internal combustion testing facility in Italy and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then one day here, oh, we pulled the machine out. They were trying to steal the tech. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. It just sounded like a bait and switch. Mm -hmm. You know, like, did that, I've been following you. I was supposed to, this was going to put it to bed. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got fortunate in that I got the actual paper, the contract that had been passed back and forth to do the testing with the major car company. Mm -hmm. And I went and read the revisions and all that. I was like, holy shit. 
They tried to steal it at really? the end. Wow. Yeah, it was wow. clear as a bell. Wow. It went from, we're going to pay you X number. It's pretty expensive to get them to test it, mm -hmm. to we're going to pay you this hefty price to have it tested in your facility, and you own any technology that, that you care to. They were wow. literally stealing the IP. Wow. So they had to pull the machine out of there, and they'd spent a lot of money getting everything set up and mm -hmm. the right people in Italy and all this, mm -hmm. and they pulled it out. So you just you can't give it to big organizations. It doesn't seem to work out well. Mm -hmm. What you can do is make money with it. How do you mean? And if that machine yeah. in London, yeah. when that starts making money, mm -hmm. does Malcolm and his gang that are – I'm not economically invested in it, but mm -hmm. the, there are some people that are. Mm -hmm. Do they give a damn whether anybody believes it? Mm -hmm. If it's making money and they're right. making – Right. And you can go do it again and again and again on every landfill. That's one monetization scheme. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just take, obviously like sucking up go, the methane essentially. On yeah. The well, no, or? it's just no. It's it, again the the exhaust when you're going. You take the methane, you burn it in an engine, mm -hmm. and you make electricity. Mm -hmm. But the engine then pollutes, mm -hmm. and it has a, ca a it. permit cap Got that it. you can't produce but this much carbon monoxide. Right. So right. if you can eliminate carbon monoxide, you make all the all you want, mm -hmm. and then frankly, you're printing money mm -hmm. relative mm -hmm. to your competitors. Right. And I think that's a pretty good path to prove it to people gotcha you know yeah. as you continue to build up this pile of economic proof yeah do you really care mm -hmm. i mean I, you know I, and people always say well i don't understand how it works i'm like well do you understand how electricity works <laughs> right. <laughs> right right and the, the smarter the smarter a person gets the more they answer that question hell no right right, right? yeah and so we've been using the shit for 120 years <laughs> we know how to manipulate it and yeah, all yeah. that but you don't really know yeah yeah how it works it's like a cell phone we don't really know how a cell phone works. that's I mean, right very and few I, people I think do. this technology would be kind of yeah. kind of be like that yeah gotcha. you know gotcha. where only a few people have hints of understanding mm -hmm. of about how truly cosmically it works, mm -hmm. but we know functionally what the hell to do with it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think a, a monetization is a good way to prove something. I think continued public demonstrations. We've got some testing that we were able to do at a very credible entity. Mm -hmm. And the damn thing broke, and we weren't able to do the last test. And that group is waiting on another thunderstorm generator. Okay. And that should be relatively soon. And what was going on with that testing is there are ways to game such things. And they cut, and again, I'm not a mechanical type, but basically you overwhelm it with air and you get so much air, you call it running lean. And I don't know, there, there are some paths to do things that could look like this briefly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that you don't have to fend off that criticism, which we've already seen. Mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah, that's normal. That's going to be there. Like, that's right. You, you go and do a test not to prove it to ourselves, although that's interesting, yeah. but where you actually are controlling for every air input into the system. And mm -hmm. that hadn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. We've done all the pollution testing and it's all, you know, home runs, mm -hmm. but you need to do some testing. that says, well, it can't be this alternative method for doing something kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And that's still to be done. And then hopefully a report will, will come out after that. I know some people are probably asking, well, does it run more efficiently? That's usually a very quick question. It was not intended to, mm -hmm. but it happens to run 30. Some have seen it run 70% longer okay. on a given amount of fuel. Okay. And on, under load. Mm -hmm. um, so when do we find out? Like, what's like? Uh, when do we find out? You know, is this is this uh, by the cosmic summit? Yeah. Okay. By June fifteenth. Okay. That's when. That's the. That yeah. We're going to find out at the cosmic summit. No, we're going to find out before, and then it's okay. going to be the first formal unveiling. Okay. All right. You know, and whatnot. Cool. Cool. Yeah. cool. And I've invited Malcolm to speak, and some people were like, "Oh no, no, yeah, you know, yeah." That guy could be a fraud, even if they, there's some people say, well, he's clearly a fraud and you yeah. made a mistake here. Yeah. Or he could be a fraud and you get embarrassed. I said, well, there are either two eventualities. Right. By June 15th, either it's still standing mm -hmm. and I'm going to want to see it there even more, mm -hmm. or somebody, you know, flips the table over and we were wrong about all of this. Mm -hmm. And I'll disinvite Malcolm, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sure. it's right, not going right. to be as interesting to people at that yeah, point, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. But he is going to come. We're not going to make it a centerpiece of it because we kind of talk about different things. Oh, another person, Malcolm credits. God, I can't believe I'm smooth. So he gives the 20th century guys the credit and then he gives the ancients the credit. Okay. See, he believes this was the tech of the ancient mm -hmm. or he mm -hmm. says it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's fundamental to his whole understanding of this. Okay. Is that they had access to plasmoid technology. And one of the things you're like, well, how do they have a superstructure, a stack of tech to run this stuff? Hmm. I don't know. There are ways that you could imagine that this probably isn't that difficult. So how? So give me yeah, an I don't example. Know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe the pyramid. Yeah, maybe the pyramid. Yeah. And Bob Grinier, who is a good friend and uh, uh, publishes the Martin Fleischman Memorial Project on YouTube, mm -hmm. highly recommend that. Bob Grinier and the Martin Fleischman Memorial Project. Okay. Um, I actually had him on the foxhole, mm -hmm. and he explained how Malcolm's thing, how the pyramids were Mm -hmm. the, the the Great Pyramid mm -hmm. uh, was a machine that was using Malcolm's process. Mm. Okay. And you see that at the foxhole? And Bob was no acolyte of Malcolm's. He had, I knew him before Bob did. And then Bob got into it and went over and saw the big machine in London. And he says, holy shit, you know, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't punch a hole in this. Mm -hmm. And then he started looking at the inside of those spheres. Mm -hmm. And you can see that all on his channel. And they're... Um, there are signs of nuclear reactions within the metallic lattice. Okay. In fact, they're like something like 126 million of the large reactions and some quadrillion of the smaller ones. What do you mean? Like that like, it's like marks on yeah, the inside? Yeah, witness yeah. marks. Okay. They're okay. witness marks. Okay. And they're clear as a bell. Okay. And they're you know, millions of them. Mm -hmm. Um so Bob's following it very closely. You can follow it there. Um, and I think that that is going to have more and more traction because either Bob's going to say, hey, I finally punched a hole in it, mm -hmm. or it's going to get more and more interesting. That's just going to be a gigantic body of proof that he's getting. Mm -hmm. Now, it's I wouldn't call it anecdotal, but it's YouTube stuff. Yep. It's, you know. And then there's another stop, uh, which is Jordan Collin and Alchemical Science. That is his YouTube. Right. And he is a, um, a master of vortex mathematics. Okay. which is a kind of mathematics that a fellow named Marco Roden, M-A-K-M-A-R-K-O-R-O-D-I-N, uh, postulated 34 years ago, I guess it was, and had a new insight to mathematics. And a lot of people on the West Coast and around the world have smart, mathematically inclined people have become uh, quite dedicated to the idea that this math is very, very important to us, and it's been rediscovered. Okay. okay, Jordan covers that. What happened, though, the Roden people discovered Malcolm, mm -hmm. and they said, holy shit, this is the physical manifestation of our math being used for a useful purpose. Mm -hmm. we're, we're up here doing math all the time, but we know that at the end of the day, it's probably got some uses. Mm -hmm. So... His machine justified their math, and then Malcolm said, wow, your math. He was unaware of Vortex Mathematics. Mm -hmm. Said it justifies what I'm doing with my machine. I understand your math perfectly. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Or it's been helpful to me now. Mm -hmm. So those two things met. So Malcolm's kind of uh, circle of misfits around him, which includes me, <laughs> um, include these math people mm -hmm. from Marco Roden's crowd, and then kind of uh, – a uh, grab bag of younger dryas types, okay. like Johanna James, okay. has right. become a good friend. Right. In yeah, fact, she, she just bought it. him a suit. Okay. Poor okay. guy, bought him a sweatshirt in Moorhead City, North Carolina, in September. Mm -hmm. And I go over to London, and he's still wearing it. Okay. Every day. Okay. And on the okay. third day in London, he's still wearing his shirt. Yeah. And I yeah. pointed out Johanna, and he goes, "Well, we've got to get him some clothes." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, I'm not a. I, I right. just, you know." Yeah. That seems something that maybe a lady would do. And she goes, well, yeah. certainly. Right. And now she's taking him shopping, <laughs> nice. got him dressed up. He's not a big money guy. Yeah, gotcha. Too. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, he doesn't seem to give a damn. He wants to give away all the ownership of it. Has already made moves in that direction right. that right. I can't speak of. But Well, uh, that, that's different than the last 10 people that, that ended up dead, that, you know, that, that were more interested in making it about the me and, and less interested about making it open source. Uh, uh, so. There are two kinds of people that have made these claims in the past. Yeah. They're either cons or dead. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And, and what Malcolm says, though, and you say, well, Malcolm, when we're driving down to Rogan, he's saying all this crazy shit when I first met him, being Brad Young, who's uh, Randall's guy. Yeah. We're at the Bucky's, you know, and they're taking a leak. Yeah. yeah. And we're walking in there. We look over at each other and go, 
what the fuck? Are we safe, man? Because he will tell stories of assassination attempts and international intrigue out the ass. That's okay. why Rogan didn't show the show. Yeah, yeah. Because he got off on all this other stuff that he's got insight to yeah, and okay. participated in some of it. Right. And Rogan says, this is just too hot. Yeah. And uh, But so we're at the Bucky's going, you know, man, is this stuff for real? Yeah. And he kind of scares you like that. And But what he says is that they've green-lighted him. Okay. That like UFOs, uh -huh. say the five eyes, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. I've kind of given up on it. Okay. You know, okay. Yeah. it's like UFOs, that if it's behind the curtain, they're good guys and bad guys, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the good guys are want some kind of disclosure, and the bad guys want to keep the secret. Mm -hmm. And it seems now the good guys are ascendant, but mm -hmm. they're not going to have the press conference mm -hmm. that says, oh, we actually have had this thing since 1947. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we fired the guy who wanted to keep it a secret. Right. That's just not going to happen. Right, right, the right. best that can happen is the good guys get you to stop suppressing it. Yeah, gotcha. And they they take the thumb off the scale and just let it progress naturally. Right. And that's kind of simplification of what Malcolm says has happened with him. Okay. The other people have come forth. But and it's because of the internet, which begs the question why they gave us the internet. Because mm -hmm. that was an mm -hmm. invention of those people mm -hmm. too. It's hard to hold that back. They, they right. probably figured we got 30 years of making them dumb. Maybe we can make yeah. them so dumb that we'll have them forever. <laughs> right. But right, at the right. same time, the internet's working against them. Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. And they can't play whack a mole. Right. With all the UFO stuff. Right. And, and the, the free energy, if you want to call it, advanced uh, breakthrough energy. Yeah. They can't play whack a mole. And they said, ah, let Ben Dahl run with it. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, we're going to find out. We certainly are going to find yeah, out, yeah, man. Yeah, can't wait. Can't and I wait. look forward to doing it with you, man. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. Been, that's been fun. Um, so we got the Cosmic Summit. Yep. I got to pitch it. Can't wait. Yep, go for it. Go for it. Let's hear about it. With June 5th, uh, uh, 15, 16, and 17. Yep. It's actually Father's Day weekend. It's right. going to work work for us with some, against us with others. Yep, yep. Right? And yep. that it's either going to be like, I got to go be with my dad, I can't make it, or I'm dad, and that's what I want to do for my day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right, right. And that's Sunday. But we, we've got uh, 27 speakers now. Okay. And I would have some more, and there are a lot of people calling for what I call, we. I try to break the, the, the conference down, or I do break them down, in my mind, between speculators and scientists. Uh-huh. Um, so call it PhDs and YouTubers, mm -hmm. right? Gotcha. Right, right. And I want to have it as one third uh, academics mm -hmm. and credentialed, mm -hmm. and they might be kooky. Who mm -hmm. knows? Might be kookier than other people, but mm -hmm. somehow they got the credentials. Mm -hmm. They're generally not. Yeah. And then the other two thirds um, being mm -hmm. speculators. The problem is there's so many good speculators, and I get contacted a lot. But have this person, have that person. They're all great people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you got to go draw one scientist out mm -hmm. for every two speculators I right, had. Right, and right. right now I'm overweighted with speculators. Gotcha. So yeah. I'm trying to bring some in. So we may go as long way as saying we may go up to over 30 speakers. Okay. Adds more scientists. They're going to break it into two parts this year. We're going to have two tracks. Last year it was one stage, one podium. Mm hmm. This will be a main stage, obviously, and then two uh, up to 500 people breakouts. We could potentially have up to 1,000 people or more, actually. Um, and we're going to run it for two days, as we did last year, but with two tracks. And then we're going to have a third day, which I'm calling Classroom Day. Okay. Okay. And we have a wonderful facility I'll talk about here in a moment. But okay. it happens to include four uh, auditorium-style lecture halls. Yeah. Not the big place we're doing it in. And they're classrooms. And we're going to have one with Randall Carlson in it and his team where mm -hmm. they're going to talk all day long. So deep dive on Randall. Mm -hmm. All you can handle. Mm -hmm. Eight mm -hmm. to six or whatever we do it from mm -hmm. on Monday. And then we're going to have another room with um, my buddy Scott Walter, okay. the um, Templar historian. Okay. And... Uh, uh, host of America Unearthed. Okay, right, right. Yeah, right. and a tremendous guy. And he's bringing along his buddy who will be new to the thing. Scott came last year, but Tim Hogan, who is kind of the number one Freemason in the in the world. Hmm. Okay. You know, he's mm -hmm. the kind of the top of that pyramid. Mm -hmm. And and Haley Ramsey, who's on their team, mm -hmm. who's going to speak to the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. In the Templar tradition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and uh, in 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 symbols and whatnot, it's fascinating. I heard her out in Sed Sedona; she's terrific. Mm -hmm. So you got a Randall room, a Templar room, then a Bendal room, 
Okay. So I'm going to have Malcolm there because yep. Malcolm is a long, long form kind of guy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He's not a, even an hour. Mm -hmm. He ain't going to be able to touch it. So mm -hmm. even if I gave him two hours, so it just ain't right. <laughs> so, so, and it's a little, even though he credits the ancients as having this technology and can speak very competently to that. He knows as much about ancient history. I'd as like you to hear about that. Yeah. I'd like to yeah. Hear yeah. He can speak. That. I yeah. mean, he knows all the ancient cultures. You're like, yeah, again, if this guy's a con man, he sure did learn up some yeah. stuff that wasn't directly relevant. Right. And so he's going to do that. So you got uh, Randall, Scott, Malcolm, and then we're going to have a UFO run. Oh, cool. Just cool. for the hell of it. Okay. That's fine. right. Yeah. Because I didn't want to put too many of those on the main stage because it's a little off topic. Right. But there's a big Venn diagram in interest. Yeah. And no there's doubt. so much going on now. And we already had Micah Hanks as a part of the Cosmic Summit because he's a younger dry ice guy and also a good UFO guy. Okay. Right. Right. And um, so we'll go all day on UFOs. And we so it'll mm -hmm. be different that way. Another way it's different. This is a mammoth facility. This is the largest convention center between DC and Atlanta. Okay. It's privately owned. It's not a public thing. It's a family I grew up with in Greensboro, North Carolina, the Corey family. Oh, okay. Cool. And they have a, a huge real estate complex that uh, they sold the mall, but they um, kept a, the tallest store, the tallest building in Greensboro, 27 story Sheridan Hotel with 1,000 rooms in it. Okay. And then at the belly of it ha is a mammoth convention center. Nice. And the main room there holds 6,000 people. It's called the Guilford Room. Okay. 35 foot ceilings, nice. built in Broadway stage. We don't have to bring in all that equipment and mm -hmm. all that setup. You know, nice. it's plug and play. Nice. And we're going to throw some damn lasers and rock and roll in there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And mix science, speculation, mm -hmm. and rock and roll and fun. Nice, nice. Friday night, we're going to have a, a gigantic disco party. Okay. The, the fella, uh, Mr. Corey, uh, wanted to build himself a disco in the late 70s. He built the largest disco probably in the South. It holds 1,000 people. Okay. And the Corey family has kept it as a time capsule. Nice. You go in there. I've still never been in there when all the lights are on because, like, they just keep the lights off. And you go in there, and it's just like, oh, my God, this is a crypt from 1979. Uh, it's all the red leather and the brass. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. it's got three levels to it and the stage and the round. We're working on getting a big comedian for that night, but that'll be a rocking party. So you'll nice. come in Friday. You have the big rocking party, Saturday, Sunday, back-to-back, -back, all-day lectures. Yep. That We're going to make the speakers available to people. They're going to have their tables. Mm -hmm. So if they want to go talk with people, you'll know where to go see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Got a good VIP program, and we're going to have, this year, we're going to have, uh, if I can get on it, uh, uh, much better vendors and uh, exhibits and that kind of stuff, because I've got more room and more time to do it. Okay, okay. So, yeah, nice. they can, uh, the passes are available now at okay. CosmicSummit.com. Mm -hmm. um, we're on all platforms. We put out one to three videos a day from our speakers, mm -hmm. like their content, either from the summit or other places they've appeared. Mm -hmm. We you know, pluck out 45 seconds to two minutes and dress it up and do shorts. Mm -hmm. And we're building a worldwide following that way. We've had 30 million interactions, got about 60,000 followers now. Nice. Um, and, and that keeps clipping along. So thank you for that extended, yeah. the opportunity for extended update on the cosmic. Side. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's January. It's uh, bearing yeah. down yeah, on yeah, me it's now. Coming man. Up. It's yeah, coming up. Yeah, you're yeah, get yeah, on yeah. You got some work to do. Yeah. yeah. And we're, so we're selling tickets. We're selling them well. Yeah. And we have a yeah. community too, of the cosmic uh, circle. Uh -huh. Discord, and damn the Discord. You know, you get scared when you start those things because they can peter out, yep. and you're willing to take the chance. Mm -hmm. And it kind of clipped the treetops okay. Okay. <laughs> in like November, and I was yeah. like, I don't know if it's going to make it. Yeah, pull and, up, pull up. And now it's man. It's like I'm getting like five new people a day. Nice. You're nice. like hell yeah, and yeah. they're in there talking. And every time I go in, all the subjects are lit up with new comments. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm like, holy shit, yeah, this thing's cool. living. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's fun to build something. Yeah, it yeah, is, yeah, and particularly yeah. if it's self sustaining. Right. And right, you want to yeah. get in there. I think it's rude not so I'm in there every day. Yeah, cool. But. It's self sustaining. I could right. drop, blow away, and they're all going to be in there. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. yeah we look cool. forward to having you, Matt. Awesome. Yeah, I can't Thank wait. Thank you so uh, much for the invitation that. here yeah. to Sarasota and yeah. Bradenton. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I love what you're doing. You know, it's a great thing you're doing, like bringing, you know, bringing all these people together, having the idea to bring all of these brilliant people together that are all researching and attempting to push us forward. I mean, you know, we get we get so stuck with with the traditional ideas and the traditional belief system that to yeah. explore all of these possibilities and explore these new ideas is just critical. And there wasn't like, there wasn't a place where you could do that prior to you having the idea to bring everybody together and to, to make this happen. And it's so fun to be with other 
other people that have these obscure interests. Yeah. Because yeah. first of all, there are a hell of a lot of us. Yeah, for sure. But not quite enough that you're going to find one in your immediate social circle. Right, 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 right now. But more and more people, as time goes on, as they hear That's podcasts right. like this and, you know, just the information. As people, Amen, man. As people hear the information, it's very difficult yeah. to, to, you know, to be like, oh, that's just, these people are crazy. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Younger Dry is a perfect example, you know. I yeah. mean, it's like, it's, but, but so, yeah, that's growing. It's growing just like the three of you grew to 50 million, you know. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah, who yeah, yeah. Knew about it, it needed so. a public face. It needed a place yeah. where you could go, you know, uh, slap skin with other people that are interested uh, right. in this shit. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. it worked. Yeah, for sure. It yeah. had a vibe last year. If I can get that vibe back this year. You will. You will. You know, it's going to grow. I mean, the vibe's going to grow. Yeah, beautiful. For sure. I hope so. Yeah, man. yeah, for sure. Yeah, awesome to awesome idea. Awesome to get it done last year. It was kind of a rushed deal, wasn't it? Last year. I mean, you. I I'd, I'd never done such a thing. Yeah, Hell, yeah, man. I've yeah. never. I'd never had a damn birthday party. Yeah, yeah. I thought you so, had the idea, and somebody told me you had the idea like January or something. No, and, and no, no. I got. No. Them, I even had people signed up to speak by August. Did you? Oh, of okay. last year. Oh, okay, okay, I, okay. But I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I'm much further ahead this year, even. Though Good. both years I had a year, okay. I'm w much much further ahead, and I'm not Good. as nervous. Last year it was just I'm like, what? How is this going to turn yeah, out? Yeah, what if this is yeah. just a shit show? Right. Then Graham <laughs> dropped down. It kind of turned into a shit show. Then yeah, we built yeah. it back. Yeah. yeah, and and it turned into an absolutely beautiful thing. I had my in laws and stuff there. They're like, I thought this could be a bunch of geeks. This is a wonderful group of people. Yeah, that's cool. And they all really love each other, and they never even met each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. and um. We're going to do it again this year, bigger and better, man. Yep, yep absolutely. That's yeah. awesome. I can't wait. Super excited to be there. I and, can't and wait for your work to yeah. continue to blossom. I brother. appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I'll keep it going. So, okay, man. Very good. Well, great to chat with you, man. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming on the show. So any other words on how people can can follow or, or, or stay? Um, the Cosmic Summit, I talk more on Twitter than anywhere else personally. Okay. So as a personal matter, if yep. people want to get in touch with me or follow whatever happens to be on my head yep. on any given day, yep. I'm yep. happy to follow you back. Yep, cool. Yep. <laughs> and um, that's at uh, Cosmic Tusk. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. I appreciate you coming down, man. It's been fun to get to know Terrific, you. Terrific, so, Matt. Yeah. It's good to get to know you too, man. Yeah. we got a lot of runway in front of us. We do. It's going to yep. be fun. No doubt. No doubt. Appreciate it, man. Good. Okay. All right. That's a wrap. Hey, awesome, bro. Hey, good stuff, man. Hey, that went on kind of long for you, didn't it? No, all good. All good. We good? Okay. Yeah. How long was it, Ryan?